and welcome to another uh, development stream uh, for Aeon Zen. Um, hopefully everyone is nice and cozy today. Um, so this uh, stream um, assumes that you have seen the, the previous one um, because some of the things that I am going to talk about kind of expand on um, the concepts covered last week. Um, I guess I'll keep this this open so we see a little bit less of the infinite stuff going on. Um, and uh, if so, if you haven't, you might be a little lost, um, but that's okay. You're of course still welcome to be here, um, but you just might not completely understand. Uh, everything we're we're talking about um so but for those of you who were here last uh week hopefully uh this will be interesting for you um so before we get in to actually coding uh, i just want to go over um, a little bit of some concepts three important concepts in the engine um that we'll be using today um and these will kind of help help you understand a little bit about uh, why we're programming things the way we are and stuff like that. So the three important engine concepts I'd like to go over are uh, game actions, triggers, and activations. Um, and because I don't see any complaints, I'll assume everybody can hear me fine. Uh, so I'll keep going. So the first is game actions. Um, so whenever the game or a card does anything, um, you know, it's not just doing some logic. It's actually like performing something in the game. Um, whatever it does is encapsulated in a dedicated game action. Um, so some examples of these would be moving a card from one place to another. That's a game action. That's something that's happening within the game. Um, so this has a dedicated object uh, called move card action and uh, you provide which card is moving and where it's moving to. Um, it already knows where it's moving from because you can get that information from the card. Uh, another example is casting a spell with a spell, cast spell action. So you say which mage is casting the spell, uh, which spell is being cast and what the target is. Um, and you can't just get the uh, the mage information from the spell because in Aeon's End, um, other mages can cast the spells of uh, of other mages. Um, so you can't assume that it's the one who has it prepped or anything. So you always provide that information. Um, and another example is using an ability. So you just say use an ability and then you provide which mage is using the ability and that's really all that's necessary because all the rest of the code uh, the mage has. And we'll go into that a little bit more later. Um, so before and after a game action occurs, uh, they, that is the game action, are sent to the view so that it can um, prepare for the action so it might want to like go into a different screen or something like that and then display any animations or effects related to that action. Um, so uh, I'll give an example of that in a bit. Um, but basically the, act sending, the, the engine sending actions to the view is how the view knows what to show or do or whatever next. Um, otherwise the view would just sit there not knowing and the engine would crank away at, uh, internally, but the view would have no idea what's going on because that's the way, that's one of the main ways that the engine talks to the view is by sending over these game actions. Um, so encapsulating an action is part of the uh, command design pattern. Um, for anyone um, who's done object-oriented programming, um, design patterns are sort of tried and true um, ways of programming um, that were developed or I guess that were compiled together in a book. I um, can't remember exactly when. 
Um, but uh, it was sort of a, a group of programmers that came out with this book, and it's been really influential in uh, pro object-oriented programming. Um, but it keeps all the information about the event together in one package. And this is extremely useful because then if you need to know anything about what's going on, uh, it's all encapsulated in an object, which is much easier to deal with than a bunch of parameters flying in different directions. Uh, any questions on that? Um, okay, that looks like uh, everything's going well so far. So, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the next thing I'd like to talk about are triggers. Um, so, uh, we did this in, um, we started this in Sentinels, and uh, we brought it back for Aeon's End. Um, excuse me. Um, the, uh, the other games um, generally didn't require them. Uh, so we didn't need to use them there. Um, but basically triggers are events that respond to a game action. So a game action is coming in and they always have uh, four pieces of, inf of information. So first is what kind of game action they respond to. So for example, they might say, whenever there is a mu move card action, uh, it wants to take a look at it. And so the next important part is the criteria to which they apply. So um, anytime this action occurs, I want to take a look at it and see if it applies to my criteria. So an example of the criteria is whenever a spell goes to a mage's discard. Um, generally, uh, triggers are used for, you know, like you can kind of see them uh, in the way cards are written. Like whenever A occurs, do B. Um, that would be considered a trigger. So uh, this is just an example. Whenever a spell goes to a mage's discard, so it's looking for any time a move card action happens, and then it sees, okay, uh, is the card a spell? Is it going to a mage's discard? Um, if both these things are true, then there's a response. And basically this is just like, here's what happens. Um, and so this is just a chunk of code that we put in to the trigger. Um, and let's just say in this example, it's uh, the mage gets to draw a card. Um, and so it meets these two and does this response. And the fourth piece of information that's really important is the timing. Um, whether the trigger responds before or after the game action. So it is allowed to um, a trigger is allowed to respond before the game action has actually happened, but is about to happen. So an example of uh, events from before an action would be increasing the amount of damage when a spell uh, will deal damage, um, redirecting the damage to another target, or canceling the game action altogether. Um, so we'll be seeing an example of that. And an, an example events that happen after game action, um, there aren't a lot in uh, Aeon's End so far, but one example is um, Edelheim has the ability to, uh, after a, a um, Nemesis card has been drawn, um, you're allowed to look at it and then decide whether or not it takes effect. Um, so if you use his ability, the card immediately goes to the Nemesis discard and the card has no effect. Um, so this is a good example of, a, of an after game action. So right after the Nemesis draws a card, this trigger goes off and it says, oh, hey, uh, you can use your ability now if you want to. Uh, if you do use it, um, then it cancels the action right here. It cancels... Um, the part where it actually plays the card and and then it uh, its response is to move it to the discard. Um, are we good so far? Let's see. Um, lurk and work. All right. 
looks like everybody's uh, hopefully following along. All right, um, next up is activations. Um, so activations are anything in the game that the player is able to directly interact with. And by the player, I mean like, um, you know, the, the person physically sitting at the computer clicking on things or whatnot. Um, as opposed to like the mage. Um, so all the activations are sent to the view and then the view tells the controller which one the player wants to use. Um, so some examples are, you know, the uh, in the main phase it sends play one play card activation for each card that can be played. Um, in the casting phase it's, it sends one cast spell activation for each spell that can be played. Or, or sorry, for each spell that can be cast. Um, but first the view has to tell this activation uh, who the damage target is. Um, so we'll see that in a minute here. And then uh, another one, use ability activation. Um, so, and again, this is for whichever mage is allowed to use their ability. So an activation is saying this hasn't happened yet, but it's allowed to happen. And it just sends, you know, maybe perhaps like all three of these to the view at once and says, here's all the options of what the player can do. And here are the parameters um, relevant to those um, to those activations. And so the view is responsible to uh, tell the controller uh, to proceed on an activation. And the activation runs the code of whatever the activation actually does. So the view might call proceed on play card activation and it will play that card. Um, you know, there's of course some internal logic there. Um, like when you gain eth uh, ether, um, some new activations come in and as you spend it, some of them go away and stuff like that. Um, so there is a bit of internal maintenance, but that's the general idea. Um, just checking if there's any questions. Okay, it seems everybody's either following along or busy with something else. Um, okay, so um, so here's an example of all these things sort of coming together. So here's an example for casting a spell. So the controller is over here, and that's the part that David and I program. And the and the view is over here, and that's the part that, um, well, there, there's three views. There's the unit test, again, which David and I program, the um, console, um, which David and I program, but then there's like the main UI view, uh, which is what um, players see when they play it. Uh, either in beta or in release, and that's John's responsibility, and that's the most complicated view of the three for sure. Um, and so the general flow, okay, so let's say there's a cast spell activation coming in. So we're in the casting phase, um, there's a card spark, and it's prepped, and it's ready, and it can be cast, but it hasn't been yet. So the engine um, sends a cast spell activation and the spell to cast is spark but it doesn't know what the target is yet um, because that's up to the player that's not up to the engine to decide which target the spell is going to cast or um, damage to so the ac that activation is sent off to the view um, the view shows the, the prep spell spark flashing in the breach so you can imagine you're in the casting phase and it's glowing, um, indicating that you can use it now. So then let's say the player click drags from the spark to Rageborn and then releases the mouse button. This is the player's way of indicating, hey, I want to cast spark on Rageborn. So then the view has to do two things. First of all, it calls uh, a method on the cast spell activation called give info and it provides the target um, because the view needs to provide any missing information um, and in this case it's the target um, so it says hey uh, 
we're targeting the target is Rageborn. The next thing it does is the view calls proceed on the activation, which means okay, now you have all the information you need. Go ahead and use this activation. From there, the engine takes over again. Um, so the first thing that it does is it creates a cast spell action, and uh, its parameters are um, the spell to cast is Spark, and the target is Rageborn. And it sends this action to the view, and then the view shows an animation of the spell being cast from the breach, so that you you kind of see like those sparks, uh, um, those particle effects, kind of going off towards Rageborn uh, in the demo. And then casting that spell um, runs code on Spark, and Spark's um, uh, code is pretty simple. It just says um uh deal deal one damage to the target um, so that creates a deal damage action and the source is um well it's actually both so it's geon um in this case like we'll just say that she's the one casting the spell uh and the and this spark is the one uh responsible for this damage happening the target's rage born and the amount is one. And again, that action is sent to the view and then the view can uh, show an animation of rage born taking the damage. Uh, let's see, any questions here? Following it, not enough programming to ask any meaningful questions. Um, you know, that's fair. Uh, as long as you're following it, uh, I'm happy. Um, and uh, okay, and so this um, shows both how activations and actions are involved, but it doesn't show a trigger. So I'm going to also show an example of that. Um, so the example of breach increasing damage amount. Excuse me, I keep stopping. I have some some gas in my stomach that isn't uh, settling well. Um. Maybe that was too much information, but oh well. Um, anyway, so here's a trigger going on. So first we'll deal damage. Um, so let's assume this has all happened, but the uh, spark is in a, uh, a breach four, which increases the damage by one. So the deal, deal damage action goes out. The source is again Gion. The target's Rageborn, the amount is one. Um, but what I didn't show you in this previous slide was that it also says which breach uh, is responsible for this happening. So that action is sent uh, to a trigger because um, the breach has a trigger. And the breach controller, and again, we'll assume this is breach number four, um, has these four uh, elements in its tri criteria. So first, it's looking for a deal damage action. Okay, here's one. Okay, let's take a look at it. The criteria is that the deal damage breach right here is this breach. So again, we're assuming this code is on breach four. So it says, aha, uh, this deal damage action is coming in and it's breach four. That's me. Okay, I'm going to respond now. The response is increase that damage by one. And it has to happen before the damage because if it increases the damage after the damage has been dealt, then that's kind of useless. Um, so then that trigger creates this increased damage action. Um, it provides the action it's modifying, which is the one coming from in here. And then it says how much to increase it by. And then the increase uh, damage action modifies the deal at damage action. So now um, the amount has increased from one to two. And now it's ready to go and it sends that off to the view. Um, so we'd be here except we'd have a, a two instead. And again, it shows an animation of Rageborn taking damage. But the view might decide to show it differently, like, you know, for each point of damage that's being dealt, the, um, the animation's a little bit bigger, 
or the sound effects get a little bit more intense or something like that. Um, so that's pretty much the overview of my presentation uh, before we get started. So I will just uh, read here. Um, goes to show how much goes into a simple action in a video game. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, there's different philosophies in programming games, you know. Some people code all their games in a sort of game jam style where it's just like almost everything is hard-coded or coded, um, you know, spaghetti flying all over the place. And if it's small enough and the scope is limited enough, um, that can be fine. I mean, that's how it works in a game jam, usually. Um, but generally, uh, you know, principled programming is easier for maintenance, um, especially as the game gets bigger and bigger. Um, and in our uh, field especially, um, um, expansions are a big thing, right? Um, especially in Sentinels and Aeon's End. Um, and so you want to be able to program in such a way that you can expand it later um, without necessarily needing to know what those elements are. And so if, if I just told the view, um, you know, if I just told the view, like, cast this and do this animation, um that might get really problematic when expansions come out and try and interfere with that. Um, but if you do it in sort of a principled, sort of encapsulated way, you can just kind of add little chunks to the code and the chunks know how to interact with the bigger, larger system and uh, things work better and smoother. Um, you know, obviously there's still things um, you know, we need to adapt to, and any time you add a new action or activation, the view needs to know what to do with it. Um, but right from the very start, we um, we say, you know, like we make a structure. Um, we're kind of showing you what our structure has been for Sentinels and um, and Aeon Zen, and. Uh, and we know how to use that structure. And so far, it's been working really well. Um, it doesn't mean there's no bugs, but it means that when there are bugs, we know what to do and where to go. We're not just like following strings upon strings of like threads going down into other threads that go over here, that go over there, and it's like really hard to fix anymore. The exception to that is guys, um, but uh, if we'd known about guys right from the start, we might have accommodated him a little bit better, but um, we do what we can. So, guys, yes, guys is the exception to every rule. All right. Um, so now that we've got that, um, let's get into some programming uh, with that knowledge. Um, so today we're going to program a mage, and a mage has two parts to it. Um, they have their mage mat, um, which basically has uh, information about the breaches when they start, uh, their starting hand and the starting deck, you know, their title and all that good stuff. Um, but the most important and interesting thing of each mage is their um, special ability. Um, so Fijaxa has an interesting one. Uh, you activate immediately after a turn order card is drawn. Um, so you know in Aeon Zen, uh, turn order isn't fixed. Um, between each turn, you turn over the next card to see who goes next. And that's usually random. Um, so right after you do that, you can use this ability, which prevents any damage that the players or Gravehold would suffer during that turn. Um, that's a really powerful ability, um, you know, especially as things get desperate. Um, but yeah, it's kind of interesting because it's like, uh, 
you know, she can activate this at a time when normally players have no say. You know, normally you just turn over the turn or order card um, and then go from there. But she kind of interrupts that flow a little bit. So that's interesting. And then uh, every mage also has a starter card that uh, is unique to that mage. Um, and Fidaxtra's is the Tourmaline Shard, gain one Aether. Any ally may suffer one damage if they do, they, they destroy a card in hand. And there's actually been a change to this, but I'll go over that later. All right, so let's get started. So if you'll remember from last week, the first thing that we do is a definition. Um, and this is basically just kind of text data uh, explaining, basically making it so that the game has some reference point for what this even is. Um, so I will add one for Fidaxtra. I'll just copy Mist so I have a little template. And Fidraxa. Make sure I sp spelt that right. Uh, yeah, okay. And Breach Mage Seer. Um, all mages have a max life of 10. Starting cards, Tourmaline Shard, three crystals, and a spark. The rest are already there. That's the nice thing about just copying and pasting is sometimes things are already what you want them to be. And the starting deck, four crystals and one spark. So we just go like this and we're done. Um, and now the ability, it's called Auspex Rune. Make sure I spelt that right. Um, so activate immediately after turn order card is drawn. Prevent any damage that the players or grave hold would suffer during that turn. Okay. Um, and if it's available to us, usually we'll just copy and paste directly from some source, but just for the sake of example, I'm just putting these in. These are pretty short anyway. Activate during main phase. So some of them have this underlined special thing that says activate during main phase, um, but this one doesn't. So I'll just take that out. Um, required ability required charges. That's how many charges are required in order to uh, use the ability. It's five, so I'll leave that alone. So interestingly, she has no breach one. She only has three the whole game. Um, so I just take this out, and then. Um, this one starts open, so I'll take out the rotation information, um, which means that it starts open. This one starts at rotation, so the top is zero, the left is one, the bottom is two. It's just sort of something to remember. Um, so that one starts at two, which it already is, and then this one just starts at one. And that's all I have to do there. Now. Rather than writing all the story body, I just pre-wrote that because it takes a long time and isn't particularly interesting to watch. So I just went ahead and do that there. Um, and then I usually um, check my JSON to make sure I wrote everything right because um, the compiler won't tell you. Uh, it doesn't really know the intended structure of JSON. So I just put it in here and it says, Valid JSON, because if it's not valid JSON, then when you try and run it, things will mess up. So you'll find out eventually that it's not working, but may as well find out as soon as you write it. I'll check the chat here. Um, with these encapsulated systems, have you reviewed all the AI AE expansion legacy content to ensure you don't run into something like guys. Um, 
and then uh, oh, yeah uh, John's been answering here um, yeah so we we've been given uh, all the expansion content that exists so far and I've had a chance to look over it um, and actually we're at a point now where we uh, sort of decide the scope of everything while we're even making the proposal so before the project is even an official thing we kind of go over it to see what the overall scope uh, that we know of uh, is so far um, with sentinels it was already sort of set and ready to go and because it was our first project we didn't really have an established structure yet um, we kind of made that up like the system we're using is something we made up for sentinels um, and we've been using it uh, in a variation of that uh, ever since because it's been working really well for us um, but so for example um, if we has, in my presentation here um, let's go back here what was it so here casting a spell whenever we cast a spell um, we provide a mage right now in sentinels um, whenever somebody plays a card you can assume that the person playing the card uh, is the one who owns it so if legacy plays a legacy card you can assume that legacy is the uh, hero when guys came along he changed that because you know now guys can suddenly be the one using equipment or uh, owning the ongoing or whatever um, but because our system already assumed that um, you know a card is being played and used by the hero that owns it um, that caused like it would have been uh, a lot a lot of work um, to suddenly add all like to suddenly change all that around to make it so that you never assume who is using it um, in hindsight it might have been less overall work but I mean who knows it's hard to compare at this point um, but if we had have known about guys when we first started we probably wouldn't have ever assumed uh, who was um, playing the card or using the power or whatever um, we would have said you always have to tell us um, and then that that's what guys would have sort of tapped into but with Aeon Zen, we know for a fact that one mage can cast the spell of another mage. And so right from the beginning, we we said, whenever you cast a spell, you have to tell us the mage that's doing it um, and make no assumptions. Um, and so that's made that aspect a lot easier. So even if that hadn't existed in the base game, um, but we saw it in expansion, we might have just put that in right from the start because we knew what was coming. Um, so yeah that's an example and some of the things we've done with breaches um, in the expansion you know breaches can be destroyed or you can have a card in two different breaches or you can um, have multiple uh, spells in a single breach um, we've already structured the engine to accommodate that um, which we wouldn't have done if we didn't know all that expansion content so um what about things planned but not yet written they although not settled yet uh yeah right so this is you know this is the thing is like um zay's uh character has sort of been developed re very very recently um and is in flux and whenever something's in flux we take it a little bit more lightly um, because we don't want to like suddenly restructure or do a whole bunch of work that will never get used um, so you know but we know about it now and we're still pretty early on so you know once it's pretty established what Zay will do or at least far enough along that we need to play test it um, 
then we'll probably make sure that everything accommodates that without any problems. Um, the nice thing about doing that before the release is that we don't have to worry about um, save game file conflicts, um, which is another thing that uh, um, you know we have to account for. Is as soon as the game is out the door, all save file has to all old save files have to always be importable to the new releases. Um, and that can sometimes be tricky. Uh, you know, sometimes we have to deprecate things but leave them there because otherwise it won't be compatible with old save files. Um, but before we have a release, um, you know, we're allowed to make changes and not worry about those um, because, you know, beta testers sort of understand that, you know, sometimes things just aren't compatible with old save files while they're testing. And that's... Um, you know, not a really big deal. Um, and as long as, you know, there's not quote unquote, um, you know, paying players playing the release version with it. Guys must require an impressive number of test suites. Yeah, he, <laughs> he probably has by himself an amount of tests equal to uh, the total amount of other heroes or something. So, um, yeah, yeah, there's some answers there. Okay. Anyway, I'm going to keep moving because, uh, I mean, this is all really interesting to me and it seems like it's interesting to you, but I also don't want to monopolize the whole afternoon since it's already, um, uh, 1437. So, um, okay. So now we, we've done the uh, definition. That was no big deal. We're going to make uh, the mage. Fedextra mage controller. And um, I'll just copy over good old Gian. And there we go. Um, Okay, so the first thing I usually do is, uh, whoops, um, just copy in anything that's important here. So usability, so every mage has to have implement this method called usability, and that's basically like, okay, you're using your ability, what do you do? So as soon as she uses it, prevent any damage that the players or grave hold would suffer during that turn. So you'll notice that as soon as you use it, nothing much happens. Um, it doesn't immediately change anything. All it really does is, uh, basically it just sets a flag saying prevent damage this turn. Um, now we don't have a global no damage this turn thing. So usually when it comes to something special like this, we have the, uh, the card um, keep track of it by itself. Um, and this is just encapsulation. Yeah, basically like separation of concerns, like only Phaedraxa is interested in this. So the first thing I'm going to do here is make a property. Um, let's see, what will I call it? Make it an int. Damage, damage, oops. Call it damage prevention turn index. Um, so every time there's a turn in Aeon Zen, um, the game is internally keeping track of a turn index. And it's basically as soon as the turn order uh, card is revealed, there's a new turn index right then and there. Um, so it technically starts at that point, uh, at least as far as the game engine is keeping track of it. So basically, this is just going to be a nullable int. Uh, if it's null, it means the ability isn't even in use right now. But if it has a number, it means that's the uh, turn that we want to prevent damage. So, um, whoops, it auto-completed without, okay, I don't, what, stop. Sometimes helpful things can just be confusing. Um, and I'll just, 
Whoops. There we go. Um, so we'll get this uh, property. Now you might be saying, well, this is already property. Why are we just calling get property? Um, this is a special thing, uh, get property and set property that saves it to the model. Um, and the reason we need to do that is um, so that if you save a game and leave and then come back and load the game, the game need, the, this uh, particular property needs to have the same value it did when you left. Um, and so whenever we run into that situation, we need to save and load it from the model, um, which we talked about last week. Um, and because um, if we don't, then this, when we load the game, this will be null again, even though it should have a value. And so that's something we've got to be careful with, with the model view controller um, structure is knowing when something needs to be in the model and when it can just exist in the controller. And in this case, it needs to be in the model. Um, so, and here we have set property int, uh, same key, and value. Okay, so now we have somewhere to store the information. Um, so basically, when you use the ability, all that really happens is we um, store the turn index um, of the turn to prevent damage. So we just say this dot damage prevention turn index is right. So we just basically say, okay, we're using the ability. Um, so this is the turn that we want to prevent damage from for. Um, and that's basically what using the ability does because usability is just what happens right now, right? What happens as soon as you click on this? And that's all that basically happens. Um, so all the magic happens later. And that's why uh, I made sure to introduce the idea of triggers and stuff. So I'm just going to take a look here. All right. So, um, right. So there, there's an override function here, um, called add triggers. And basically this is called on everything. Um, when the game starts, well, it's called on every mage when the game starts, it's called on cards when they're played that kind of thing. Um, so basically, this is like, tell me all the triggers you need to exist. And a lot of cards don't need triggers. In fact, most cards don't, and most mages don't. But Fidextra does because this is sort of, um, this is an ability that has like a period of time and looks for certain events and stuff. So um, the first consideration is when does this actually activate? Um, when does this happen? Um, so it says activate immediately after a turn order card is drawn. So I'll put that in there and I can just uh, copy this from here. Okay, so we'll add a new trigger. And the first thing we have to do is um, say what kind of game action we're looking at. And in this case, it's a move card action because it's basically when the turn order card moves from the deck um, to the discard to determine which player is going. The next thing we need is a criteria. So this is an anonymous method here. Um, I won't really go into explanation as to what those are, but just in case you're wondering what this is all about and if you've never seen this before. But it's a way for us to make the criteria really quickly. So the first thing is um, uh, we want to make sure that uh, Fit Extra has enough charges to activate the ability. Because if she doesn't, there's no point in stopping here. 
Um, you know, if she can't even use her ability, we don't want the game to pause and say, you can't do this, continue. Um, so if Fidaxia has enough charges to activate the ability, and so anytime a card is moved, there's like a reason for that. Um, and that's just an internal way for us to know what's going on with this card move. And if the reason is to determine the next turn taker, um, which it only ever is whenever a turn order card is, you know, flipped over to see who goes next. Um, so that's all we really need for the um, criteria is the, the ability is ready to activate and we're determining the next turn taker. We move the card to determine the next turn taker. So next we need the response. Um, so of course the uh, response is just to activate the ability, just to make it available. Um, so we have sort of a standard to end our, end whatever is happening with the word response. Um, and this is complaining because this doesn't exist yet, but I'll make it exist in a minute. Um, so that's the response and then the trigger timing. Uh, so we want this to happen after. So after the card has moved. If we set it to before, then it's like the card is about to move and we can use the ability. But it's like, what am I using the ability for? I don't know what I'm responding to yet. So, um, so now we create this. Um, and then every response has to take in the action uh, that occurred, um, just in case it's important. Sometimes it's not, sometimes it is, but we just always provide it because it's, then you have it. Um, right, so all this basically does is um, activate uh, Fidaxter's ability. Oops. So this is the mage that's, that can use the ability. And then there's a Boolean called wait. Um, wait basically is like, do I have to sit here and wait for them to use this? Or can I just like move on and leave that activation hanging? Um, in this case, if we set wait to false, um, then Fidextra's uh, ability would activate, but it would just move on to the next turn. Uh, and that's not good because you want Fidaxtra to like decide, are you going to use this or not right now? Um, so we'll say wait true. And then uh, we just need some boilerplate here. So I'll just grab it from Jen. And that's, that's pretty much it. It just activates it. It's like, oh, okay, the card has been drawn. I'll activate the ability. Um, and activating abilities is by default optional. Um, so they'll also, it'll send, actually send two activations. It'll send the ability activation and a continue activation. The continue is basically like, I don't want to do any of the activations right now. Um, so it's, you know, skip or whatever, to, however the view decides to show that. Um, okay, no questions, so I'll keep moving. Um, so the ability has been activated and when you use it, it just sets the turn index. So it's like, okay, I'm going to prevent damage this turn. Um, so the next thing we have to do is actually prevent that damage because otherwise this, this, um, value is pretty meaningless. If it doesn't actually do anything. Um, so I guess I can just copy from here. Okay, so I'll add a new trigger. And this one responds whenever damage is dealt. So a deal damage action. And we need a criteria because we don't want it to respond to all damage. Uh, we just want it to respond um, in certain situations. So first of all, we want to make sure that uh, we're looking at the right turn, right? So damage prevention turn index has val value equal to 
the current turn. Basically, this says, make sure that this turn and this turn match. Um, and I mean, I'm going to do some maintenance to make sure that it, it should never be the case that they don't match if it has a value. Um, but this is sort of like bug prevention kind of stuff where it's like, let's say for whatever reason, this didn't change and always had a value and I didn't check it, then all of a sudden damage would be prevented to players and, um, to players and the, um, grave hold for the rest of the game, <laughs> um, which, you know, some players would like, but I think most would just be like, okay, this is too easy. It's not fun anymore. Um, so this is more of a, a backup plan. And, so, you know, sometimes you do that if not doing it could result in um, a substantial bug. All right. So that's just basic error checking. But the main thing we want to check here is... Uh, is the damage target a mage or is the damage target a uh, gravehold? That's the more sort of like meat of this. And if it is, prevent damage response and trigger timing. Now this one is before because it has to cancel it before it happens. If it cancels it after it happens, it's already happened, so it doesn't matter anymore. Um, so we go ahead and do that. Okay, it wants to do a different line thing, whatever, that's fine. Um, so, and then we make another private, um, and this is for a deal damage action. And, um, and then so this time, we just prevent the damage. Um, so to do that, we just go cancel action. And then we say, what are we canceling? We're just canceling the damage. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Okay, so now we uh, prevent any damage on that turn that happens if the damage target is a mage or is grave hold. And then the last thing we need to do is set this back to null after the turn ends. Um, and that's just to make sure it's not hanging with some value that, you know, doesn't apply anymore. Again, it won't, even if we don't do this, it won't cause a problem because um, it'll, it'll check for the turn index anyway. But it's not good to have what I at least call uh, hanging properties, basically like leftover data that's sort of meaningless by that point. So uh, reset the turn index and the turn. So we add one more trigger. And so this is when we're leaving uh, the turn. So uh, change state action. Um, we use states instead of uh, phases in Aeon Zen because it's a little more granular than what uh, you see in the rule book, uh, but it's basically the same idea. Um, so basically, um, if, the, if that value, if that property has a value at all, um, and we just left uh, a a turn basically if the one we're if the state we're leaving from is the end of turn um, then here's where we need to reset it uh, and we'll do it right afterwards so that way we know for sure that like this isn't going to reset it prematurely when the turn isn't actually done it waits until right after we've moved away from an end of turn. Um, and this is pretty straightforward. Uh, change state action. 
And all we do is set this to null. And then we have to, even though we're not doing anything, uh, an I enumerator has to return something. It can't just, it's not like a void where I don't have to do anything at all. So we just return null and then it knows there's nothing else to do. Um, reset the to null. Okay. And as far as I know, that's pretty much it. We've just uh, coded her ability. Um, so I'm just going to take a look here. I'll take it. Okay. Um, so uh, the next thing to do here is um, make a test for this. So first I'll compile my code, make sure there's no problems. Um, where'd all my tests go? What? Did I load the wrong project? No. Unit tests. Um, showing a test summary here. Oh, okay. This is filtered. All right. Filter. All right. Oh, great. Good thing I saw that. All right. I was like, what's going on? Where'd all my tests go? All right, so the next thing to do is to make a test. Um, so I will do that. So new game, first mage is Fidraxa. So code. So the first thing we want to do is go to determine a turn um, taker. And we expect that there is not going to be anything special going on. Um, so we're not going to prevent damage. So we go to determine next turn. We want Phaedraxa to go. So she doesn't exist as a property yet, so I'm going to have to do that. I'll just go like this. Uh, we just make little shortcuts here um, for each of the mages so that they're um, quick to access when we need them. Um, go to... Uh, Go to next, determine next turn. Okay, what? Ah. There we go. There we go. Um, there shouldn't be any ability activations. Okay, so now um, charge up Jax's ability so we go to her main phase um, we'll give her a bunch of ether to work with um, she uses the gain charge activation five times um, but even here like so normally right as soon as they use uh, gain all their charges they can use their ability but in this case we don't want that um, because it's not supposed to happen here. So I will just go ahead and test that out. Um, okay, it's already failing. Let's see what happened. Oh, okay, so it's complaining because Fijax is supposed to start off with the uh, Tourmaline Shard, and there's no definition for that yet. Um, so I'll just put in a stub for that, and we'll be filling it out later anyway. Um, um, and then it should be okay. It should be happy. So sometimes you gotta, you know, make the compiler or runtime or whatever happy just by putting things that you don't really need yet. But uh, that's fine. So 
So I may as well just put in all the information since I'm here anyway. So it is a gem, cost zero, uh, gain one ether. And um, so the, the text has actually been changed for this card a little bit um, based on our discussions with the uh, designer um, because in the case where you um, choose an ally that is exhausted to take one damage, um, based on the rules of the game, uh, that gets doubled and goes to grave hold. Um, but the designer still wants them to be able to destroy a card. Um, so really, it's any ally may suffer one damage and destroy a card in hand. So they don't actually have to be the one taking the damage um, to destroy their card. So that's the difference there. May suffer one damage and destroy a card in hand. Okay, and let's see. Damage one, destroy. Uh, what's ether? Gain ether. Okay. Gain ether one. Um, and I'm just going to put FPO here in case. Uh, just so it's more obvious that this needs a second look. And then the flavor quote. Uh, I have that here. Um, again, it's really hard to see on these things. So I just look at a, at a physical card. Um, right, so it's just a flavor body. So I don't, it's not a quote, so I don't need all that extra stuff. Um, bird, um, with a sense beyond sight, only she remembers the world that was. Okay. And basic error checking here. I guess I should just keep this open. Okay. All right. Now let's try our test again. That was a bit of a side trail, but it needed to be done anyway. So, okay. It's happy now. We take a look. So, turn order. Mage one moved to the turn order discard. Going, so, okay, so there was no like interruption here. So that's good. Um, and now Fijaxta gains a bunch of charges and she gains uh, five total, but we don't see anything indicating that her ability is ready to use. And that's good because you don't want to be able to use it yet. Um, so we'll go back here. Go to to determine next turn and use her ability. So we'll say that Rageborn goes next. And um, because it's waiting for us to reply, we actually have to like ahead of time say whether or not we want to use it. We can't decide at that moment. So uh, we'll say use next ability. Yes, do it. Okay. And I'll just run that. Um, there's not really anything for it to fail at, but we can at least take a look manually. So the Nemesis card moved to the turn order discard. So an activation comes in. Uh, Phajax's uh, Auspex Rune ability or continue. So we can either use the ability or we can bypass it completely with a continue. And then using Phajax's Rune ability. Um, so it removes five charges and they now have zero total and then it disables and deactivates it. Um, so she's used it. Um, and again, uh, if we look at um, 
what's actually happening here, all it's doing is setting this. So there's nothing else we expect to see yet. So we won't be able to verify it works until we actually uh, get into the turn a little bit. So um, let's take a look. So um, Rageborn's uh, cleave card says Rageborn strikes. And one of his strikes cards called Raise says Gravehold suffers three damage and any player suffers one damage. Um, so that's a great example because both Gravehold and a player would suffer damage in that turn. So we just have to make sure that they don't. So the first thing we do is uh, a life um, storage here. And basically we're just putting um, the mages, Gravehold, and the, the nemesis. And basically this just says take a snapshot of what their uh, health is at this time. And then we're going to stack the Nemesis deck with Cleave so that it plays a strike card. And we're going to stack their uh, Nemesis specific deck with Raise. So again, this will attempt to deal Gravehold and player's damage. Then we go to the next uh, draw phase. Um, so that'll go to Rageborn's draw phase. And um, we expect that no one's life has changed. No one has actually taken any damage uh, because the effect is, of the ability is supposed to prevent it. So let's run that test and see if that indeed happens. Okay, there's a check. Let's take a look. So right here, Rageborn draws uh, the top card of their deck. Cleave uh, goes to the play area, which causes Rave, Raze to move to the play area. Um, and so there was supposed to be an event called Rageborn dealt Gravehold three damage, um, but it was canceled. So that's what we expect. I know this output is a little wonky, but don't worry about it. It, it's, it is saying that it's doing the correct thing. So it canceled the damage to Gravehold. And then um, an activation comes in, select a player to suffer one damage. So this is something I'll have to deal with later. Um, basically, there's no point in selecting who's going to take damage if nobody's going to take damage. Probably, but we haven't really discussed that with the um, the designer. So I'm just I'm just going to pretend that this uh, is fine for now, and I'll fix it later. Um, but basically, once you do select um, a uh, mage to take damage, um, Rageborn is supposed to deal them one damage, um, but again, that's canceled. Um, so Rageborn is finished playing Raze. Uh, it moves um, back to Strike Deck. It's shuffled back in. It removes Fury tokens because usually uh, that's what that's a part of what happens after he strikes. Um, and Cleave goes back to the discard, and Cleave is considered to have been played. Um, so that is good. It's preventing that damage. Um, so next we want to just make sure that um, if Rageborn goes again and does the same thing, uh, the players actually do take damage because we want to make sure that Fijaxtra's ability isn't hanging around for longer than it's supposed to. Um, so I'll just... Uh... So we um, actually should just be able to do this. So in this case, um, Gravehold takes three damage and Fidextra takes one. And let's try that. And another check. So that's good. So, uh, right. So. Visual Studio has this annoying thing where if the output's too long, it's like copy it and put it in a text editor. I have no clue. I guess it's a space saving thing, but I I don't like that feature at all. Um, but whatever. Okay, so here's the one where the damage is prevented and then here's where it's supposed to have gone away. 
Um, so cleave move, da da da. Rageborn deals Gravehold three damage, and they are now at 27 life. So it actually did go through this time. Before it said it was canceled, now it actually happened. And then Fade Extra is chosen automatically, and Rageborn deals Fade Extra one damage, and they're now at nine. Um, so indeed, it doesn't hang around when it's not supposed to. And that is pretty much it. We've just implemented uh, Fade Extra in her ability. Um, so that is implementing a mage. I will commit that and then check if there are any questions. Okay. Um, all right, looks like we've got some questions going on here. Uh, and some answers, but I'll just read them anyway. How does the code handle the act activation window? The ability says it has to be activated when a turn card is revealed, but I didn't notice where that was checked in the code. And uh, David says, since they represent player inputs, activations get handled by the view, in this case, the testing framework. Uh, wait, I think I misunderstood what you said. The prompt to decide when to use the power props pops up due to a trigger whenever a turn order card is drawn. Yeah, so uh, if we go back here, um, this is the trigger that's deciding when this uh, ability uh, activates. Um, so whenever we move a card, and the reason we're moving a card is to determine the next turn taker, and the ability is activated or rather it has enough charges to activate it. Um, then it just jumps here and activates the ability. Now, acti again, activating the ability doesn't mean it's using the ability. It just tells the view that it can be used now. Um, and that, so I think, you know, in a lot of, it, this is a little confusing just because in tabletop games, whenever it says activate your ability, um, that usually means you're using it right now, but this is just sort of a mixture of terminology here because in, in our program, an activation just means something the player can do, not something they are doing. Um, so I can understand that if there's some confusion there. Um, remembers, oh, did I spell something wrong? Yeah, must have. Um, Tourmaline. Oh, an extra E. Um, logical function greater than already understandable debug text formatting. Yeah, so um, yeah, so I think this is a, I'm not quite sure how to interpret that, but I think this is a comment on like what the actual debug output looks like. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's not super user friendly. Um, you know, if we released a game and this is all it did was show you this kind of stuff, uh, it would get, you know, zero out of 10 reviews and people would set their, iPads on fire and whatnot. Um, so uh, yeah, this is purely for our benefit to look at, um, just to make sure things are working. Um, so as long as the people using it know how to interpret it, uh, that's as good as it needs to be. <laughs> um, yep, okay, yeah, I agree. Um, all right, so now we're going to do the tourmaline shard, and that's actually quite simple compared to uh, what we just did, so it shouldn't take too long. So we've already done the um, the definition. Uh, so now the next thing is to make the card controller. So we'll jump over here and add.
Um, and it's just a basic relic. Um, sure, I guess I'll copy this one. And hollow it out. I'll leave this stuff here because that's useful. Um, right, so the first thing, any, first of all is gain one ether. Now, because this is a gem, and I guess I should put that, um, that'll happen automatically uh, because of this right here. So any gem can provide its ether information and that'll just happen automatically. It's just a convenience thing. Um, we could have manually put it in each time, but we just decided that as a convenience thing, we'll just do that. So really all we have to worry about is the second part. So I'll get the, uh, the text here. Uh, so any ally may suffer one damage and destroy a card in hand. So the first thing that happens is um, select target and deal damage. So the thing dealing damage is this card, so that's the damage source. The amount is one. Um, the target criteria, it has to be an ally of um, It has to be an ally of the owner of this card, uh, which will always be Fajaxta. So uh, the target, which is T, means uh, the collection of this mage's allies has to contain this, this particular target. Um, select target reason. Um, player is suffering damage. So it's not a player dealing damage to another, it's just them suffering damage as per the wording on the card. Um, yeah, I don't think there's any other special information. Oh, we need to store the results. This is just a way for us to know who uh, took the damage. Um, hold on. Did select mage. I forgot what my helpers were, so I had to think about it for a second there. Um, so basically, select a target and deal damage. And if the selected target was a mage, um, so sometimes we do this. Um, and this is just to indicate like different sections of the code. Um, And we, we just get the selected mage from that decision. And then we can select and destroy a card uh, from hand. And the person doing that is that mage. Okay, so first, any ally suffers one damage. So we select who, it must be the ally an ally of um, of Fijaxta, and that's one damage, and they're suffering damage, and we store that result, 
and if a mage was indeed selected you know because it might be that it's sort of an error checking thing uh, then we get that mage since we already know a mage was selected and then they get to destroy uh, a card from hand uh, and that should be it for the programming um, of the card but now we have to test it to make sure it actually works So gain one ether. So we want to make sure that she's doing that. So first we'll go ahead and play it. Go to next main and play card. Okay, so we'll assume she's already played it. Um, and afterwards she'll, she should have gained Gain an ether, uh, an unrestricted ether at that. And also, uh, now in this particular game, she only has one ally, so it'll automatically be um, Rama. So I th think I'll add a third mage just to make it so that we actually make some sort of selection here. Um, let's see, I forget offhand what cards Mist has, so I'll just take a quick, quick peek here. Uh, Garnet Shard, that's the one. Um, so first we do some life storage. Um, of the allies. Um, so, Fijax down. Uh, the second one's Brahma by default and Mist. And then here, um, we'll say Mist does this, all this, so she's the one that suffers one damage. Um, and so select next target uh, missed she's the one taking the damage and then we also need to know what card we want her to destroy so we will get that card from her hand she'll destroy your garnet chart not because that's it's probably not a great idea most of the time I guess I guess later in the game you might want to do that but um, it's it's a good example because it's a unique card. Um, so missed guard shard. So select next card. All right. So basically, this says when I get a decision from the garnet shard about which target will take damage, it'll be missed, and uh, when I get a decision about what card to destroy, I will choose the Garnet Shard. So assert at location, Garnet should be out of game. Uh, and I think that's about that's about all we need to do here. Um, so let's run that test and see if something fails. Uh, there's a check mark, so that's good. So I always read them, even if they have a check mark, because sometimes it actually didn't do anything special. Um, so playing the Tourmaline Shard, it moved to her play area. She gains one ether. They only have one total. Um, these move out of the way. A new activation comes in. Select a player to suffer one damage. We select Mist. These come back temporarily. Uh, Tormai Char deals missed one damage and they're not nine life. It disables them again because there's another decision to do. Um, 
destroy a spark. So these are the cards in her hand. She can decide which one she actually wants to destroy. These are separate activations. So a spark, uh, one of the three crystals she has are the garnet shard. We choose to destroy the garnet shard. Um, it's moved out of the game. The garnet shard was destroyed. Um, if it actually played tourmaline shard and uh, it deactivated. And it's actually supposed to deactivate all these other destroy card uh, things. So I'm not sure if I must if I did something wrong there. Um, yeah, it looks like I have a bug to work out. Um, but I'm not gonna. I've taken up a lot of time already, so I'm not gonna do that live on the stream. Um, so, I mean, you know, this is pretty, this is not uncommon for me to do all this and then find that something's not quite working the way I expected. Uh, and sometimes it takes a long time to fix and sometimes it doesn't, but the unknown factor is why I don't really want to do it live on the stream. Because it's John time, so I'm just going to commit this as is, even with, uh, with that little bug there. And I'll note that there's a bug to look at, um, but I'll push that up. And uh, yeah, normally I work these things out before I send them to John, but in this case we want to uh, have something to look at. So, um, but thankfully the uh, Fujaxa stuff, um, eh, my turn just about, yep, um, work seems to be working fine. So uh, hopefully um, that's enough to look at. All right, um, I'll see if there's any questions, quick questions here. Um, you mentioned earlier that if Gravehold suffered the damage then the card should still be destroyed. Uh, no one takes damage, does the card destruction still happen? Um, well, it has to be an ally, so I don't think that it's Gravehold. Um, oh, I see, oh, if they're exhausted. Um, yeah, so as long as she uses it by this, by the change of the words, then yeah, uh, they still destroy a card. All right. Um, thanks everybody and enjoy the next portion. Don't touch that dial. Stay tuned. Bye. Hello out there in internet land. Let me know how the audio levels sound to you. Turn my mic down a little bit, I think. I've got some background music, so just let me know if that's too loud or anything. And I'm gonna make this iPad stop doing that. Chat only, excellent. All right, thanks Jean-Marc uh, for the ever instructive um, engine programming segment. Uh, I'm John, uh, lead developer, and I will be doing the integration of Fedraxa into the UI. I'm going to give myself a timer here, or a stopwatch, because last time I was really sh only like half an hour and it should have been longer, so let me do that. And we'll see. Uh, background music subtle, but pleasant. Excellent. All right.
that is the temporary Rage Gorn music that's in the demo. Uh, it's not the final music. Jean-Marc will be making music and I'm sure we'll eventually have a music stream from him around that. All right, so uh, Jean-Marc has done some programming, so I am going to pull that down with my handy script that will get the latest code and build engine DLL. Whoa, so much .cs. <laughs> Don't push the buttons with butts, uh, Evil Dice Monkey or Bishop83. Uh, that's the one that uh, Jeremy sits on with his butt and shouldn't do that. All right, let's go back to Unity. It is going to uh, recompile its stuff as it is wont to do. And we should be able to uh, get started here. So uh, what I'm gonna do, I have a little list. Uh, so first we're gonna we're gonna sort of reverse it from Jean-Marc. I'm gonna get the, the starter card uh, implemented or, or make sure it works uh, and do anything that needs to be done there. Uh, and then we'll make sure uh, we'll get onto the ability uh, next. And then if we have time I'm gonna look at uh, starting on showing uh, a player mat for Mage, which we don't have in the demo you don't see the player mats at this point but uh, we're gonna plan to be able to bring those up and so uh, I thought today would be a good opportunity for that. All right, so looks like we compiled. So I'm gonna edit my debug settings here and choose a different mage. So we're gonna have, let me type, Bedraxa uh, in slot one. And that's really all that's needed right now is, and I'm gonna not clear this spark up uh, because uh, we just got our starter card. We don't have like another player card to add to the supply or something. Terminally in charge to just come right in. All right, so it looks like uh, the game started okay. Uh, as you can see, we don't have any artwork for Fridraxa yet in the game. That's something that uh, Jennifer is going to integrate as well as for uh, the Tourmaline Shard, which is right there. And we can right click it and uh, see its effect there. Uh, so uh, you can see its effect that Jean-Marc put in, gain one ether, any ally may suffer one damage and destroy a card in hand. It's a gem, so when you play it, its effect will happen right away. Um, you can see that the uh, small card text uh, has some of the icons, but we don't have an icon for, um, I believe, suffer. Uh, yeah, we'll have to figure out the small card text. It's got FPO in there. Jamar puts FPO in there to make sure that uh, we have a look at it. But we'll make sure that we uh, put the iconography on that uh, that we want. Uh, yeah, we probably need a, an icon that says something about an ally suffering damage as opposed to dealing a damage to uh, to the enemy, which that icon usually means. Uh, so yeah, why don't we go ahead and play the card and uh, and see. All right, so I played the card and a bunch of stuff happens. What it's, what it's doing there is, as you saw in the, the engine as well, it's deactivating all the other things that were going on, so you can't play cards or buy cards or do other things right now, uh, we need to make this decision about uh, which of our allies is gonna suffer damage. So uh, you can see these buttons have popped up uh, and a little hint that says you should click on them to assign the damage uh, to who should take it. So let's choose Brahma, sure, we can click on her health indicator or on the button. And, uh-oh, uh we have an error. The error says that we don't have any activation view for that destroy card activation. So uh, the view doesn't know how to, what to do with this thing that the engine is sending. And so I guess I better deal with it. So if we don't do anything, the engine is still gonna wait for us to go ahead. So we're just sort of stuck here. And so if this sort of thing happened in the wild, it'd be like the game froze. The game didn't really freeze in a way that a developer might think, but it is, it's not making progress because it uh, doesn't know what to do. Uh, so let's pop that open and see, yeah, so here in the activation view factory is where it's trying to find those activation views we talked about last week where uh, the engine sends an activation object and we have a view that is dedicated to dealing with that uh, and, and knowing about, you know, what, uh, what other controls should I uh, update and how should I make, make this interaction possible. 
So let's uh, create one for destroy card activation. So I need to make a new script for this. So I'm going to a little folder of activation views of all the things. Uh, and let's create a new C-sharp script called destroy card activation view. And we'll open that up. So here is our default Unity template. Uh, so usually it is, oh, I'm getting a spinny rainbow, which means I might have to restart Visual Studio here if this happens. <laughs> yeah, let's do that. Force quit. Whoa, Hall of Mirrors. All right, sometimes it gets a little cray cray. Let's try this again. FPO, FTW, says Cytosine. Exactly. Cytosine thought I said quater mass. I'm not sure what that was in relation to. And I don't know what that is. <laughs> uh, let's come on, load the project. Streaming is always tough on my little MacBook Pro here, but. Uh, all right, so. Let's just pull up another activation view to get some of the boilerplate because we need to put it in the right namespace uh, and stuff. So uh, let's put it in the, the namespace that we use for the game. And once it's in the namespace, we can subclass it from the thing it needs to be, uh, which is an activation view. Uh, and it's not a mono behavior, which is a Unity thing, so we can get rid of... Actually, well, it still is a mono behavior, but we never use those start and updates on the activation views. Uh, cool. So right now it's there, and uh, it's not going to do anything, but we can at least uh, make it get created. So uh, here we're checking to see what kind of activation is it. If so, return the right uh, view. Oh, that part needs to be controller object, and this part needs to be the view object. Uh, and then we also uh, are going to need to uh, implement like what happens, because uh, you can see, uh, actually, yeah, back in the uh, game view, is it's going to call, uh, I can bring up the base class here, what it's going to call is activate on that object when it wants, you, wants the view to be able to, to do it, and deactivate when it's finished. Uh, or it'll use update display when it maybe needs to temporarily hide or show it. Uh, so we want to override, and we get a handy uh, thing here, which will say we want to override activate. Uh, we want to call the base class because that's doing some uh, stuff to show hints and things. That's handy. Uh, oh yes, apparently some British sci-fi uh, is qu quater mass. Interesting. Is it? Quater mass or quarter mass? That's unclear. All right, so what this destroy card activation view is going to need to do is find the card view uh, we want the uh, user to click on. Uh, we might have some other interaction for how this works, but for now we'll, we'll use a click. Um, so we have other similar ones that we can, can use for that. So. Uh, and the, the activation view itself doesn't really care too much about that. Uh, it, it mainly is going to tell uh, the view, um, just activate with this activation and do what you need to do. But it, it main, it, the responsibility is that this knows like uh, where to go to, to get things done so that all the, this sort of code is separated into the different, uh, the different activations and it's not like you know all in one giant if else statement or something in one class, which would be bad. Uh, so I'm just going to paste this code in because it's a fairly similar kind of code, which is finding uh, the card we need. Um, but if this code is always a little bit different between activations because it might do a little slightly different things. So uh, let's just update this code. It's a little bit of copy pasta, but it's that way because we have slight differences between each one and enough uh, differences that 
we need to do it a little, a little bit differently. But you'll see in a little bit how we uh, at least reduce the, we minimize the amount of copy pasta. So uh, here we're going to uh, find, game view controller can find the card view. And this important here is that even though the game view controller is like sort of the big, the one big class, there's lots of places that a card view can be, like it might be uh, anywhere on the screen or in different places. And so this class doesn't really need to know how to do that. Uh, the game view controller can be responsible for helping you find a card. So uh, let's do that. Uh, it's going to be a player card view, um, typically. Uh, I don't think you can destroy any other cards with an activation. So. Uh, if that changes, we'll update this, uh, but I'm pretty sure that's uh, how it works. Uh, and so what are we going to do here? So here's a little bit of the uh, activation handling in the card view. So uh, for every kind of activation, we hold on to it in a, some local variables so that uh, if we do, are doing something differently for that kind of activation, we have access to that. So uh, I'm going to, uh, this is going to be pretty similar to um, any of these activations really, but uh, let's grab the play card one because that's the one we copied before. And uh, actually, oftentimes we don't actually need all of these, but uh, we have them because uh, it can be useful for specific custom handling for those activations. So it uh, saves time in the future. And we'll update these. Uh, these are set to be like private variables that can be accessed with a property from outside in a read-only fashion. Uh, but we want to make sure that we don't serialize them. Uh, we don't uh, store them in the scene or anything like that. Uh, and here we will have a connection to the activation view that called us. and. Uh, we will have a completion handler as well. All right, so let's go back down and uh, do, 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 do. we'll make another set of methods here that have to do with this drawing cards. Um, this is something we might like if we go if we decide that we uh, don't need to have uh, different interactions and stuff for different um, for different activations. Uh, we'll go and clear out. And refactor some of this stuff so that it's not as much uh, duplication. But for now, because things are fairly early and we're not sure exactly how everything's going to work, uh, we want to keep it uh, flexible. So uh, fairly boilerplate though. Uh, and you can see they all sort of call the same methods that actually do the stuff so we don't have a lot of duplication of, of stuff besides the actual boilerplate. And so this method is what it, the activation view is going to call and uh, assign stuff in. Oh, that's the view. That's the activation. Hanging on to stuff. Uh, yeah, potentially some of these things could be like a struct that holds onto these things. That the the problem is that they're all different types, and so. Uh, and things you can see things work a little differently. So with play card activation, uh, we, we're putting it into this uh, a hash set of drag card activations where when we start a drag, we can just look into this hash set and see is anything in here looking for a drag? If so, uh, we will um, will allow the drag, but we don't want drag for destroy card. It's going to be just click. Uh, but we don't want to add it for when things are looking for a click. So uh, we'll put that in there. So that's an example of how things are a little bit different potentially. Uh, or maybe there's a, another type of um, another type of interaction that's going to be unique to destroy card like jump up and down. Probably not. I definitely don't like having this card of boilerplate. So this is uh, this is a sort of code smell uh, if anyone knows that term, but uh, it's something that we'll look more into uh, as we move along. Takewalker says code smell. Uh, yeah, so code smell is a term 
for developers where if you're working on something and it's like, this could be done better or this isn't working right. It's sort of like if you, you know, take the milk out of the fridge and give it a whiff, is it not quite right? Could it be replaced <laughs> in a better way? It's not, code smell is stuff that is a kind of thing that it's not a bug, it's not a, necessarily a problem, but it's something that can be better. Like your, the milk can still be fine to use, maybe you can make pancakes with it or maybe you can still drink it, but it's not gonna be the best. And we'll also do this. And this, I mean, this, this is a specifically one where like each method has a thing that could update its display and they all just call this because maybe one of them will do something different. Um, is sort of the idea, um, but we'll see. Right now they don't do much different, but they might do something different. Uh, cool, and so this up, you can see this update interactions is getting called all the time. And what that is doing is just saying, uh, should I update my highlights uh, uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, and that base class is handling like, you know, can anything click on this? Can anything drag on this? If so, we're gonna uh, highlight it so that uh, we can show those things. And so all those things are calling this thing uh, instead of, you know, having that code copied, which would be a really bad code smell. We only have a little whiff of like, hmm, that can be better, but it's the way it is for a reason right now. So let's get back to, uh, we've put everything in player card view that we need, I think. Um, and so, and you can see all of this stuff is like, uh, a lot of this stuff is happening through uh, base methods that are there already. Uh, Jennifer, look, it's a bool. <laughs> Does anyone love bools? Yes or no? Uh, so let's activate for destroy card. And we need to pass the destroy card. Oh wait, I'm in the wrong, whoop. I'm in the wrong one. I want to be in destroy card activation view. Woo. Luckily we have source control and it's no big deal. Uh, cool, so, and yeah. And we have a little warning here in case something's going on uh, in the view where we can't find it. Uh, so, cool, so uh, this activate for destroy card is passing a completion handler, so when it actually gets clicked, uh, we want to uh, go ahead with that activation. This little bit about allow proceed, this is actually a little different from last week. Uh, we've made a change so that the engine can send any number of activations that it wants for, uh, for the, wants to wait. So it wants the view to, to act, go ahead with one of them and then uh, once, uh, it does, the engine will carry on. But, uh, so that required changing a bit of stuff around in how the view does things. And so here we, we are passing a parameter that says, uh, when we activate this, is this method allowed to actually go ahead with the proceed in the engine or should it wait uh, to do it in a different place? And so that's what that's controlling here. Uh, on player card view, we actually need to do a couple more things. We need to, uh, check a few things. So here, when we get clicked, we need to actually call the right thing uh, that we need to do. So we're going to do that. And this, you can see this is a case where like some of these things do more things. So if you click on a, I'll go through them actually, because it's kind of interesting. If you click on a card to play it, something is doing something again. I don't know. Uh, we just go ahead and play the card. If we're discarding, we just go ahead and discard the card. If you click a spell uh, and it can be used, uh, we want it to go into a breach, but there's some sort of logic around like which breach should it go in. And we talked to Kevin about that. And what we want to do is have it prefer to go in the rightmost open breach so that it gets damage bonuses. Oh, I am frozen. Okay. Let me check OBS. OBS is green. Uh, Evil Langs Monkey says Twitch on your end is screwing up. Well, uh -huh. uh, all right, I'll just carry on because, yeah, you can catch up on the YouTube if you missed a bit. Uh, 
So yeah, so when you click a spell to prep it, uh, it has this logic about it tries to prefer the rightmost open breach and then a focused breach because those are a little more limited. Uh, and this is, you know, more of a, this is something we could potentially have logic in here with like an option that's like what you, what's your play style you'd rather have uh, a click spell go into a certain thing. So uh, that's the kind of thing where it's not necessarily engine related, it's more of a view thing where it's a, a view preference. Uh, similarly, uh, if you click on a card in the supply instead of dragging it, uh, it'll try to gain it to your deck if possible, um, or at least anywhere, I, there might be a card that gains right to your hand. If there's some, if the card has some special ability to gain it not to your discard, you probably want to do that, so it'll try to do that. Uh, otherwise, it will just go to whatever, the discard pile. Uh, so here, uh, destroying a card is just going to be a simple one. So uh, we're going to check, kind of used by the view, which is uh, a little helper property that's set checking. Is it enabled? Uh, make sure we can't click on stuff twice really fast, like matchstick man, evil dice monkey. Uh, we're going to go ahead and proceed with the destroy card. Uh, and I think that, yeah, so the play card activation also uh, is used by dragging, but we're not going to have dragging for this. Your name was said. That's right. All right, so now uh, everything is implemented in the code here for activating the destroy card. It's not going to handle cleaning it up yet, uh, but we'll get to that uh, next. Let's go one step at a time. So we uh, implement some code here. We're going to also have to add that into the activation view factory once it finishes. Looks like it's happy about that. Uh, get it a little rainbow. This rainbow is probably okay. Yeah. We'll add that right into here. You gonna put it in the right spot for me, Unity? Yep. Cool. Uh, so we added that component into here. Um, and so the activation view factory is gonna be able to find it. And we can also attach uh, hint labels and, uh, and so on so we can uh, show a hint about that. Uh, I'm not going to worry about doing that today, but you can see how that's hooked up uh, on some of these other things, like when you're, the cast spell activation hooks up to this label that says drag a spell from a breach to an enemy. Uh, that's sort of an, uh, it's probably not a, the final system we're going to be using, but we wanted to have a, a quick sort of text hint system to help uh, you get through the demo without having a tutorial. Uh, cool, so let's run the game again. And I'm gonna go ahead and choose to continue game so there's less startup time. Uh, okay, we're gonna play uh, this card. So we choose the damage, Brahma, again. And yeah, so now we uh, have, you can see these cards all highlighted. Um, obviously we will have some sort of hint or like maybe pull Brahma's, you know, full mage panel up or something like that. Something to make it more clear, like you need to click on one of these to destroy them. But that's what's happening now. It's, uh, it's allowing you to do that. So if I click on one, uh, we'll get the destroy action, maybe. Yep. And yes, so here's the bug that uh, Jean-Marc had those activations are still there and they still allowing you to destroy more. So uh, he told me that he fixed the bug. So I am going to update the DLL again and see if that's the case. Destroy all your cards. That could be very dangerous, but also very good. DLL, that's lots of letters. <laughs> Dynamic link library. A term from the earliest days of Windows. May, maybe not the earliest, but at least Windows uh, 3.1 had DLLs. And probably earlier. Someone can check Wikipedia and find out the answer for that. When was, were DLLs invented? All right. We are going to hit play again, 
and we're gonna play that good old FBO tourmaline shard and click a mage did it it deals the damage uh, we can destroy click to destroy a card it does it and so uh, everything all came back about uh, playing cards and whatever you can see these are still flashing that's because I haven't implemented the views response to deactivation uh, one thing if Jean-Marc is listening and I don't know if you noticed but uh, it's reactivating all of the other activations um, when I'm or like it's re-enabling them or something like whenever I choose the mage all the other activations are coming back and then leaving again so that's probably bad uh, if they can click on them really fast, uh, they could do something. And that's something that evil dice monkeys are prone to do. Uh, so here we need to uh, just implement uh, deactivating. Uh, so we'll override that. And this function is very similar to the other function where it's finding uh, the card view. Um, oh. Why unreachable code detected? What? Why is it all? That's weird. Basically, we need to find the card view again, and we need to call it deactivate. So let's just do that. Why is this? Oh, I see, it's returning it. We don't actually want to return that. Uh, we just want to return true at the end. All this is, one. The return value deactivate is not used a whole lot, but occasionally it's used. If you return false, it means keep this activation around for purposes. Uh, otherwise, it will clear it out. So here we just want to say to, for the view to deactivate for destroy card. And that's going to clear out those properties. Um, oh, destroy. Uh, that's going to clear those properties and remove the highlight. Uh, we also want to override the update display, um, and uh, we all, we want to do the same thing: is tell the view to update the display for this. Uh, so a lot of this is, you know, boilerplatey, but it allows us to do special things for these activations, like to make the. Uh, destroy a card, maybe it's going to do something, you know, maybe it's going to make the view bounce or maybe it's going to do something else. So there's going to, you know, we want to be able to have different things happen for different activations potentially. Uh, and so we want to have that flexibility uh, here. So let's go ahead and try that and see. Jamark is going to check that out. The bug I mentioned. Yes, uh, Evil Dance Monkey overstuffed the Power Pie by clicking quickly, but you can't do that now. I mean, you can still do it in the demo. The demo hasn't been updated uh, because we want to make sure we don't break stuff in it. But uh, yeah. All right, so let's go ahead and try playing this again. This should be, if all goes well, the end of this implementation. So. Uh, we're gonna click on, we'll click on the last one just to make it more clear that it disappears. So it fades away uh, and we carry on with everything. So, great. Then we should be able to play another card, prep a spell by clicking on it and it goes to the right breach and so on. Uh, as you can see, things are a little slow. That's because I'm doing the streaming and everything. Uh, so cool. So I'm going to go ahead and commit that because that's uh, a good chunk of work. So I'm going to mention that I update the DLL, which is a typical small commit. And we'll note that we added destroy card activation view to handle tourmaline shard. Cool. All right. So that's step one on my list. Whoop. This is what I want. Done. Now let's check out the ability. All right, so uh, yeah, we can just go back into the game. I want to have a look at what the uh, ability does in the UI. So if I hover over the charge pie, 
we see that it's the Auspex Rune. I can have it come on the scene view here to be easier to see. Uh, it's an unknown activation. I guess we're going to need to tell it about that. Uh, and there is the text. Activate immediately after turn order card is drawn. Prevent any damage that the players or Grateful would suffer during that turn. Cool. Uh, well, first we can fix that little text thing. Uh, what that's doing is showing, um, like here, on Brink Siphon, activate during your main phase, or Divine Augury, activate during your main phase, or it might say something else. So there's uh, some... That's a programmatic thing that is checking to see, like, when should this be activated? We should show uh, a different string. So that's going to be on the ability. Boo, boo, boo. Activation view? Nope, 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 nope. It's going to be, yeah, OK. It's on the uh, charge panel. OK, so yeah, because the charge panel has the ability. So and it has the. Um, these labels that have to do with uh, when it's activated. Uh, cool. So right now we only know about activating during main phase uh, in the UI. Uh, and I don't... Yeah, this is something I need to talk to Jean-Marc about is how do we show these things because it probably should be an enumeration or something. Uh, so I'm going to skip that for now and we'll get back to it. Uh, I'll just make a note. Um, uh, how to show ability activation time enumeration question mark uh, yeah because we just have an enumeration we can do a switch on that'll uh, be a little easier than having a weird if statements uh, cool all right so we're just going to skip that and we're going to try to use the ability and see what happens that seems like a plan So I already have it set up to start with four charges and enough ether to just go ahead and buy a charge. So I'm going to do that. Clicky. So the pie fills up. Uh, you can see that it's not like glowing and highlighting like it usually would be. Uh, if we filled up one of these uh, during your main phase, uh, it would start you know, glowing so you can actually use it right away. Uh, but since this one can't be used in your main phase, uh, it doesn't do anything. So let's end turn. And I would set up the next turn is going to be um, the nemesis. Cool. So now, uh, uh, this is fairly subtle, but uh, it is glowing now. And we've also got a button that says continue. Uh, and so that's the continue activation that John Mark talked about. Um, and uh, we, so we can either click on that or we can click to not use it. Uh, and I'd like to actually have it that say something different. So let's see uh, if we can go to the continue activation and have it say something a little differently. So continue activation view, I'm just gonna close other things that I don't need right now. Um, right, so there's different continue reasons. So. Uh, the default, the button's just going to say continue. Maybe we'll have it say skip, uh, something like that. But there could be different reasons. So this is similar to what I was just talking about. We have an enumeration of what are the reasons we might be continuing. Maybe we're finished casting spells, or we want to indicate that you're finished casting spells, so that's the button text. Or if you're finished your main phase, we want to say end turn. Uh, let's see if we've got a continue reason. Uh, finished using abilities. I guess that's what it's going to be. Uh, and the text will be, I think, uh, don't use ability. Because that's, at that point, that's really what it means, is you don't want to use your ability. Um, or it could be like skip ability, which sounds too much like one word, one weird word. But we can try skip ability, that might fit better in the button. Another thing here, if we continue the game, this is going to be a test of does the does loading the game here work? <laughs> we'll see. But we should see the continue button have the different string on it if it does. Yep. So now it says skip ability, and uh, you know one thing uh, we'll do. Uh, I'm 
planning similar to One Neck Dungeon where if there's sort of a subtle interaction that needs your attention, it'll dim the whole rest of the screen. So I'll show, I don't, don't have that in here yet, but I'll show you what it would look like. Um, yeah, we'll put, uh, we'll just throw something on here. We'll put on a panel and we'll ignore layout. Nice thing about Unity is you can just do this kind of thing at runtime and play around. So, you know, we can put uh, like a black 75% uh, or 50% or something like that to dim everything else. And then on the things we actually want to be highlighted, we can uh, put stuff on them to make them come in front. So uh, we want the charge parent, charge panel. We can put a canvas on that with an override and, and it's gonna pop in front. So you can see uh, that. And let's go to see the continue button too, I think. Just to, uh, there's the continue button. Luckily you can search. Yeah, so the continue button, we can also put a uh, canvas on that and override. And so you can see in the scene view here, uh, those things are popping visually out of everything else that's dimmed. You know, probably we'll have the continue button highlight as well. Right now it's not. Uh, and, you know, potentially some, some text that's like, uh, do whatever. But importantly, um, the idea is that this dimming panel doesn't interact. So you can still like right click on a card or, you know, scroll or look at your discard pile or your deck or scroll through things that are scrolling. So you can still interact with the game, but it's nudging you to focus on this thing. So if you played One Deck Dungeon, uh, you've seen this before. Um, so yeah, so let's, I'm gonna just restart it because take it, the thing I was messing with, it could uh, cause trouble. Yeah, so we call that a dimming panel in One Deck Dungeon. Uh, I just haven't got that integrated in. Uh, and that would be controlled by those activation views uh, once again. Uh, so yeah, so let's, first let's try not using the ability. So skip. Uh, we go ahead and that activation went away. So that's, and now we're into uh, the Nemesis turn. Uh, it plays a card. I just made it do the same one uh, as Job Mark did, so it did hit a uh, grave hold and it's gonna hit a mage, so cool. So we're gonna have to actually not continue the game because we went too far. So I could have it load the right file, but I don't wanna bother looking for that right now. Uh, let's just do this bit one more time. Any questions in the chat, feel free to ask. If you're lost, if you're found. Uh, let's end the turn. I'm gonna click continue game again to make sure I don't forget. All right, so here we are again at the uh, turn order phase. And actually one thing we're planning to, to improve or add here is right now it sort of subtly flips the turn order thing, but it's gonna like show that more, like it's gonna zoom it up and like flip it over dramatically and be like, Nemesis, you know, not in a way that interrupts the game too much, but makes it more obvious what's going on, uh, which is important because there's a lot going on in the end's end. So we are gonna use the ability uh, and do it. So we use the charges up, they went away, the continue goes away uh, and the turn goes ahead. So that's so far so good. We also might have some sort of something to indicate that the ability is in effect. Right now we don't have that. Uh, so hey, so here uh, Rageborn tries to deal damage and we get an error because we don't have anything that's showing this cancel action uh, that's being used here. Um, and so uh, this is the action that Jean-Marc talked about that there is a damage action, but uh, it's being interrupted by cancel action. And so the view needs to be able to handle that. Even if it doesn't, even if the view doesn't actually do anything on an action, it needs to uh, I have this error in here to make sure we don't miss something. So, so just like we added an activation view, we're gonna add a game action view for that. And it might not do anything, but at least we need to have it. So we might have it do something like 
maybe there's like a spell gets sent towards the thing and then it like gets dispelled or something, right? So there's there's always an opportunity to do stuff is, is why we have uh, this mechanism. Uh, so let's, similar to the activation view, we're gonna create this cancel action view. Uh, we're going to load, yep, load everything. We're gonna get this namespace. And we're gonna do that. And it's gonna indent for us. Come on. Maybe it's not. Fine, don't. Didn't even want that. Uh, game action view. Yeah, it's just decided to stop doing code formatting. Uh, all right, so uh, so that's a game action view. We're gonna we have again similar. We have a game action view factory, uh, and so we'll put this one in here too. And we'll choose cancel action view. And in this case, I'm just gonna leave it empty because I don't think we need to do anything here. But we'll see. We'll 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 see what happens. Maybe it'll be like. We'll put a sound effect. It's like, eh, eh. I hope people are uh, able to hear me because no one's answered me in the chat. Maybe this dream's down. I'm sure people would be talking about that if that was the case. OBS is green, so. Maybe my chat needs to be refreshed. Oh, yeah, my chat on my iPad needs to be refreshed. That is. Oh no, now it's coming up. Good. All right, everything's good. Everything's great. Let's go back to Unity and... Oh, that's right, because it's like... Uh, whatever that YouTube video of people opening eggs, special audio, soothing voices. That's what I'm doing. Uh, cool, so let's take that cancel action view and put it into the factory. You can see a lot of these actions have connections to things in the scene like uh, so that they can uh, access them more directly. Um, but this one right now doesn't need anything so it's just gonna be in there as it is. So so what's gonna happen is that can't, that it's gonna, we're gonna continue on from Rageboard's turn and the cancel action is not gonna do anything. So we'll probably just like skip past and nothing will happen. That's my prediction. So here we get the card play. And he strikes, so he plays that. So, oh, so we still have to assign the damage to a mage, which seems like a, this is a, something that we ran into Sentinels uh, a bunch, where, you know, if you hypersonic assault the villain, uh, you don't need to choose which target's taking damage if there's a choice. Uh, so this is something I'm going to make a note for Jean-Marc. Uh, if damage is going to be cancelled, don't ask who should take damage. This is the sort of thing that's easy to miss in like a unit test because uh, the unit test is usually set up to just like skip past stuff if it doesn't matter or whatever. Or if you don't specify an answer to a decision, it just picks the first thing. Uh, but here we should really not have a decision. Uh, but we will pick a mage to take the damage and then surprise they don't take damage and that's it. So, so yeah, so uh, what will, uh, you can imagine what we might do in that cancel action is pop up. Um, so actually here's a good thing. We're going to the next nemesis turn. Oh, but it's not gonna do damage. We could actually do that. We could, we could make sure that uh, it does deal damage on the next turn. But I trust that Jean Marc has taken care of that part. Um, but anyways, back to the cancel action. You know, maybe it could, it'll pop up a message that says the damage was prevented, or maybe there'll be like you know uh, a blue flash on Gravehold that's like a shield, right? That's a good idea. Like a shield that like pops up and goes -ching! damage prevented by the ability. Uh, you know. This sort of mechanism of activations and actions lets us do those sorts of things in a nice way without having, as Jean-Marc said, spaghetti code all over the place. If you're looking for like, what does the cancel action do? Go to the cancel action view. I just, I, I'm a poet and I don't even know it. <laughs> all right, let's 
get out of this and commit the code because that was pretty straightforward. So that is gonna be add cancel action view to support Bedrex ability. Cool. All right, so I'm gonna push those up because I know I forgot to do that last time for Jennifer and that caused a problem. Uh, so let's go back to my list and I'm gonna see uh, how much time I have. 45 minutes now. So I'm gonna just do a quick, quick bit about the, the player mat uh, because I wanted to have that there so Jennifer can, can do some stuff with that. So um, I'm gonna show you a testing scene. It's very exciting. All right, so let's go to, uh, so Jennifer, if you're listening, probably be about 15 more minutes. Uh, let's, ah, there you go. Uh, let's go to the card tester. Oh, I also, if you haven't seen the breach test, this is a really cool scene because you can see the cool thing that Jennifer did here. Oh, look at that, super cool. So the breaches in the UI right now don't have all of these effects on them. Uh, we kept it a little more simple to make sure the performance would be good but uh, we're gonna be adding more of these cool particle effects and stuff into the actual game. Uh, cool, so the card tester. This is a scene we actually have in all of our games. It's really handy to have a scene where you can just be like, I wanna work on how cards look and not have to like run the game and draw the card or something like that. So, um, hating spelling all hate spelling. So in this, I probably showed like the Sentinels version of this before, or One Deck Dungeon. Uh, you just get to type in the name of a card and it creates the card and then you can like mess around with it. Uh, so we have, you know, Planar Insight I popped up here. We could also look up the Tourmaline Shard, uh, which uh, doesn't have a graphic yet, but it will and the small card gets popped over here too. You can also have it show the backside uh, if we're working on that. Some things are double-sided. Uh, so let's open Rageborn. So Rageborn is kind of different because the Nemesis Matt. So it's not a card, but it's like, so John Mark's talked about uh, turn takers. And uh, so the Nemesis is a turn taker. So this is actually a turn taker view instead of a card view. Oh, that looks gross. Uh, so what you're seeing here is I have a template of the, the card in behind that I was working on. Uh, so if we go and find this and just clear that, this is sort of the template of what it's gonna look like. We don't, uh, we're working on getting the uh, bits and pieces of the images that we need to create the whole template. Uh, but you can see I've sort of laid it out where things are gonna go and it populates all the information uh, into it. Uh, and the same thing, we can create the backside. Boop, and I'll go ahead and do that again clear that out and um, we've got the picture and the difficulty number and the story and all that stuff. Uh, Evil Days Monkey asks a question. Do you have plans for having different icons for different variable ether? Playing a card that can only buy spells and a card that can only buy gems in the same turn. Uh, there, That is there already. There, uh, the starter for Gian has gem only ether uh, what's her starter? Help me out here. It's a something shard. Moonstone shard? Hey, I'm right. So, uh, so you can see there's a, uh, the black icon for gain ether, but then there's the pink icon, purpley. It matches the gem color that you can see on the player cards, uh, for, for gem only ether. And that shows up in the UI as well in your little ether, uh, available ether section. And there'll be more of those based on, like, there are different cards that are like uh, different ether that with different restrictions. Uh, so yeah, check that out in the demo by playing Moonstone Shard. Uh, cool, so I just wanted to show you Rageborn there as an example of a turn taker having a, a mat or card. And so what I'm gonna do is uh, set up a mage mat um, for that. And I think, I should have, I didn't prepare as much for this as I should have. Uh, let me pull up 
Let's see if I have this in my preview. Whoop. Yeah, this one. So here's a player mat, and I'm gonna just like export one of these as a JPEG that I can use as a uh, layout helper. Don't mind that image that says butts. I wouldn't. I have no idea what that is. Uh, sample uh, mage mat, and let's go find that. Uh, let me get that. I'll just call it Simple Mage because that's what I call it, Simple Nemesis. You can see the same thing. Uh, this was for the old layout of uh, Nemesis cards, but uh, with War Eternal, they modernized the layout of these to match the player cards, and that's what we're going to use in the digital game. But the, the Mage layout is uh, still the same. So I need to drop this onto... Actually, what I can do is go to the project in Finder and put it in and then you'll find it. And this is in a testing folder. We usually make like a testing folder like this for stuff that during development, we'll have, you know, these like, we have, you can see there's these other other ones that we had for setting up the other cards and then we'll just delete the fi these files uh, when we don't need them anymore. Take Walker saw the image that says butts. I don't even remember what that is. I don't want to click on it though. <laughs> It's probably something I put in the Discord, if uh, if I know myself. Uh, so now we have the sample mage uh, in here. And so let's go ahead and create, uh, I think for it, I'm just gonna create from scratch. So let's create an image. Uh, and we're gonna call this a mage matte front. And uh, I'm gonna base the dimensions off of the player cards. So the player cards are set up to be uh, a certain size. They're set up to be 500 by 700. That's in the context of a 1024 by 768 screen. But that's sort of the, the default resolution we work in. And then it expands based on your uh, screen size. So even though it says, ooh, sweet thunder. Uh, it's just thunderstorming out now. Uh, it's once it, if you you know if your screen is like uh, 1920 by 1080 the actual you know all this is going to get scaled uh, but still look nice uh, so that's 500 by 700 for the uh, nemesis mat uh, it's a little bit uh, wider so it's 523 by 700 I think we still want to for the mage mat is actually landscape so we don't probably want to have it fill the screen because it might not fit on a uh, four by three aspect ratio that we want to support but we can see so let's, if it's 700 high and let's give it like a nice juicy color uh, let's look at this image uh, and get the aspect ratio of it 1244 divided by 929 oh it's like almost exactly 4 by 3 uh, so if we take that and one of the nice if you don't uh, if you only use Unilit, you might not know that you can actually type in math in fields. So I can do 700 times that. And that like fills the screen, which might be fine. Well, yeah, I don't want it to be that big. So let's multiply. I could just do a scale here, but I'd rather like have the like, you know, legit thing be the thing that I want. So let's make this 600 high and we'll make this 600 times that and that's going to be there's we need room for a ui around it right so we don't want it to be outrageously high and actually i'm going to even go and make it a little smaller uh 500 times that and we can always adjust but i want i want you know with the mage mat you're going to want potentially to have like some buttons to show like show your deck and show your discard and see your breaches and all kinds of stuff so uh so we're going to want uh want that yeah, hopefully the thunderstorm doesn't not get the internet connection or anything. I'm going to close the window uh, one second. Good thing I did because the rain is coming down at about 45 degrees. <laughs> Sideways rain, as Forrest Gump would say. 
Uh, that's pretty crazy. All right, so let's grab our sample mage image and pop it in here. Let's see how I'm doing for time here. Yeah, five more minutes, I think, to get it's ready enough for Jennifer is good. So, uh, so here's our sample mage layout. Uh, and what I'm gonna do is set up a few things to, uh, to populate it. And then Jennifer is going to like make it cooler. Um, so yeah, sideways, fully sideways raise is zero degrees, but I don't think that's, or it might be 90 degrees, depending on your frame of reference, right? Uh, so one thing we do when we look at a card view is like, what are the different elements on here uh, that we need to populate? So you might imagine like if you were, um, I wanna say naively making a card game, just be like, we'll just have a graphic for each card. And you know, Edelheim is that JPEG and uh, Gian is a different JPEG. Um, and that works, but it doesn't really give you a lot of flexibility. So if, you know, suppose the text of the ability changes or some, uh, something else changes, you need to go like change the image to match. Or if you want to translate it into a different language, you need to have like a different image for each one. Or if you want to do any kind of cool dynamic effects or say have different, have a option to have bigger font size, uh, you can't do that, right? And so we always, as much as possible, try to use dynamic stuff. So, uh, so this card, we basically build the card just like uh, action phase games uh, and any boards and cards did when they made this image, which is they have, you know, an InDesign or a Photoshop file that has different layers of different things, text fields and other images and us stuff like that. And so we, we do that same work and rebuild it uh, in Unity in the same way. So I'm just gonna make this 670. They don't like the weird fractions. I don't know. That's my obsession. Not really, just like to have it nice and tidy. All right, so I'm just gonna save this for a second. And let's add a few things that Jennifer can fill in uh, on her part. So I'm gonna first, uh, most obviously, there's a big image where Edelheim is. And that's, this is probably gonna fill like most of it. Cause you can see his image actually goes all the way over there. Uh, if this is, the size of this is gonna depend on like which mage has the biggest <laughs> area. Uh, and we want to use these anchors in Unity. So in the U Unity UI system, you can anchor stuff around. And I'm gonna say, you know, this is gonna be based on probably the entire thing and then just offset some from the right by like a hundred. Uh, or, and we can, we can make this a little bit see-through. Uh, so we'll, I feel like Adelheim's probably like one of the more the most going across the images. Uh, but so let's go with that and we'll see, you know, how that works out. Uh, and Jennifer will, you know, change this size and make it exactly as needed. And then, so each of these images for the mages can just be as big as it needs to be and will be put in this spot. All right, so, and we'll call this the, the main image because that's gonna be the image that's like, that's the Edelheim image. Like that's what makes this uh, mage mat different from the other ones uh, from an image perspective. Uh, and I'm gonna go ahead and add, oh, I don't have a nemesis, I don't have a component yet, but let's put the bits on and then at least a few of the bits and then I'll make the component. So actually, no, I, mage view, is, it's just a mage view, so I uh, have mage view. Uh, this component is actually, this control is gonna be the same, configured by the same code that shows the mage on the game view. So we share that code, we're just uh, using this component which knows, you know, if I have a, an image, then I'm going to, fill it with the mage. And I'm just gonna throw in uh, an atlas here that's gonna be the wrong one, but uh, it's at least going to uh, show something because it's probably gonna be a slightly different image. Uh, we you know, have different crops and different zoom ins of stuff based on what uh, place they're going. Uh, we're gonna want, uh, let's see. So we're gonna want a, a, a text label for uh, their name, that's pretty obvious. And uh, we can put that over here. Uh, we wanna use that same font, and that font is the Fritz Quadrata. 
And one thing I like to do is, I'm just gonna hide that other thing because it's distracting. Uh, I can put the same text in it for now and then match it up. So we get like, I, it doesn't have to be exactly, exactly the same, but I like to have it be similar, right? So uh, let's put this down here and that's using the small caps and our font is a little big. Uh, and I'm gonna wanna like, this is centered and it's not gonna be that big, it's like 40 big and we'll put it in the middle of that. And it's gonna be like basically here and it's still gonna be a little smaller, so let's try. Oh, there it is pretty close. We get the A lined up. That's pretty good. I feel like his name isn't actually centered on this like line and we're gonna wanna do that. So I'm just gonna center it on the line. We can always move it. Uh, and let's put this at 134 and 163. That looks good. Uh, and uh, again, this is gonna be, right now the default anchor is just like based off the center, but this is a piece that's really tied to like the right hand side. So uh, we're going to tie it into the right hand side like that. And so it's uh, minus 100 off the left and minus 67 from the top. We could also like, this whole thing could be potentially uh, encapsulated in like a, a parent object, uh, but I'm not gonna bother doing that right now. So we have the name label. Uh, what else? I'm gonna put like, some of these things, and actually I'm gonna mention this, uh, some of these things aren't gonna be necessarily needed in the game. Like the player number is something we don't actually use in the digital version because the player number has to do with the turn order deck in the physical game having you know, numbers and you assign them and you have a number to the mage in the, in the turn order deck. But in the, in the video game, you can just, we can just put the picture of the mage on the card dynamically every time. So that's not a big deal. Uh, similarly, we, we aren't using the charge tokens like this. We're using um, a pie. Uh, and so we're gonna be using that as well. Uh, so I'm just going to, all I'm gonna do I think right now is put the name and put the life and that's gonna be that's going to be it. So, uh, because I know uh, I'm going a little uh, late and I want to make sure that uh, Jennifer isn't feeling rushed or anything like that. So I'm going to put a little box here for where the life is going to go. And I'm going to make it like a nice pink. And we're going to put a label in it. And there's some images for this that I'm sure Jennifer will put in. Uh, and I'll put a text in it. For a text like this that's inside a box, I usually like make it fill the box. And for HP, we typically use this Gotham black, which is like big, heavy numbers. And they always start at 10, so that's handy. And we'll inset this a little bit and make everything center. And that's too big. How about 28 size? That's gonna look good. So there's our life label. Oh, life label. Cool, so that's looking good. Uh, I do need to hook this up. Uh, so let's uh, hook up the name label and the life label. All right, so that's all I wanna do right now because I wanna, there's a couple more things I have to hook up to make it work. Uh, so let's make the, the main image, we'll make that show up. And the main image is gonna actually be behind the other stuff. Um, so that should be okay. I'm going to, so right now this is just an object in this card tester scene. Wow, it is really raining. I'm not sure if you can hear that. Uh, we need to save it as a prefab so we can load it dynamically. So I'm gonna drag this right into the project and that creates a prefab. And we also need to tell the game like when it's looking for a mage, like how does it know that this is the one, right? The one. So I have this card view prefabs uh, asset that has connections to all the different kinds of cards uh, prefabs that we can load up and configure. And I already have it set up for a mage. So let's hide this. Okay, so now in theory, if everything is working, I'm not sure if I fully hooked everything up, I should be able to like put in Jian and have her show up. So let's see. 
It might be that the card testing view controller doesn't have the right code to do that. Okay, yeah. Oh yeah, I think so. The code here doesn't know how to look for a mage yet. So let me just quickly do that. Uh, I might not explain this as much. Uh, basically, we're gonna be, we're looking for, uh, when we put in that, that text, we're looking for, uh, first we're looking for the player card, then we're looking for a nemesis card, then we look for a nemesis itself. Uh, how about we also look for a player card? Get play, get mage definition, that is. All right, and now, I think, yeah, so if it's a nemesis card definition, do that. There's this, blah, blah, blah. So I think, actually, this should just work now. Because I already have it set up to look for Rageborn, and the mage is basically similar. All right, so let's run this and see if we can find Jian. If so, that's gonna be the end. So if you have any questions, uh, put them in there, and I'll try to answer them. All right, let's type Jian. No. Oh. What? Oh, I see. There's an exception. Because it's trying to look for the nemesis and it considers it to be an exception. Hang on, let me run this again. Oh, but since it's an exception, it like kicks out. That, this shouldn't be an exception. It should just like return null. Uh, let me just wrap this up in try catch. This is like super hacky for now. Just like ignore the exception. <laughs> and yeah, that's system that exception. This shouldn't throw an exception if it can't find it, uh, but that is something to fix at a lower level that I'm gonna get into today. Anyone getting picture lag? It might be the case that the internet is thunderstorming the internet. This looks really cool, the alt tab thing. Anyway, let's get back to Unity and finish this up. If Unity will Come back. Uh, that doesn't look good. Well, let's see. It's just compiling, I think. <sighs> All right, Jian. Hey, look at that. All right, it looks a little weird because there's an alime and everything on there. But uh, if I go ahead and clear this and make it like dark, so. Uh, this is showing that it's populated correctly. So uh, we created the prefab from that. Uh, we created the instance of the prefab. We picked the image of Jian, which is not the right aspect ratio and everything. Um, and uh, we populate the health, which is 10, even though it was, it was 10 before, but I promise it wasn't. Uh, and uh, actually I can do that by putting a 99 on that. But it updated the name label too, so hey look, things are working. Richard, sorry we've taken up all the stream watching time, but you can catch Jennifer's portion on the YouTube. So yeah, so here we loaded Jen and uh, it did update to 10 even though I had 99 in the other thing. So, so that is ready for Jennifer to, uh, you know, at least like get some images in there and maybe tidy it up a little bit. Uh, and we'll continue to work on that, uh, but that's sort of the very first steps of having a, a mage mat in the game. So hope you enjoyed that. I'm gonna make sure to push that code up for Jennifer. Uh, add initial support for full mage mat. All right, looks like we don't have a lot of questions except about the picture lag, but hopefully Jennifer's will be better. Uh, I'm going to sign off here in a second just make sure this pushes up and uh, Jennifer is going to come on and 
do more of the integration of uh, Fedraxa, get, getting her images in there and looking good, as well as having a look at that full mage map. So uh, thanks for watching once again, and uh, we will talk to you soon. Ciao. that I am showing up on Twitch and then I will start with um, some some implementing some graphics. And so um, if you're just joining now, um, we just had a great developer streams from Jean-Marc and John and uh, implemented Tourmaline Shard and Phaedraxa and started working on um, mage mats so I will be um, going through I will be adding in the graphics for those things um, and it looks like I am live and I have some confirmation from the chat so all right so the first thing that I will do is um, well thing, so I'll show I have my uh, test configuration set up with tourmaline shard in my hand and as you can see it is missing some artwork so I'm going to go ahead and put that in and you might remember from last week all the arts going to go into atlases and let's see small card art player art player card art I see Jen's screen and hear Jen all right excellent so we have the artwork for Tourmaline Shard, and just and those are all I mean, 1,000 by 833, at least for now, um, which I think this is bigger than that, yep. So I will go ahead and export it as a JPEG at that size. And um, in case you missed the explanation last week about what atlases do, is atlases do, I clicked on the wrong thing, um, is they put multiple images into the same image to make um, the game run a little more, fi more efficiently and use less resources. All right. <laughs> yeah. The, those are some pretty, pretty good expressions, and hopefully, there was no loud noise just now because um, I'm not capturing the audio. Let me just make sure that I, yep, I have it recording also. Um, so we got to go deep into the Anzen folder. There was a loud noise. All right, thank you for letting me know, John Mark. It should not be, oh, I guess I didn't have it completely muted. Um, all right. <sighs> Do -do -do, deep into the hierarchy. 
your card art. And hopefully I will spell this correctly. <laughs> Formaline shard. And here it is now. And back preview. And it'll show up in the Sprite Atlas as well. A little far from the microphone. Sorry. Um, come on, Sprite Atlas. Do your thing. Is Unity misbehaving? All right. And there it is. So now, when I press play. The full card image is in there. Just got to add in the small card image. And that's going to go into this folder. And these are 180 by 90. And I believe they are also JPEGs, yes. So I have this small card art file. And I will duplicate that into there. Oh, let me go. Let me pause this. Don't want it sucking up my bandwidth while I'm streaming. And now I just need to make this work with the um, crop for the small card art. And I'll zoom out a little bit. fit both of them in there and her crystal so I think that's pretty good let's try it out we don't want JPEG low we want JPEG maximum of course let's double check that the other one saved out correctly So um, let me resave this one and make sure that, because I want it to be a high quality, not low. two atlases now, so it'll take twice as long to pack them. I don't know. I guess I have a lot of stuff running right now. Um, I'll probably close some of these things. Yeah, I don't need to have InDesign running. Nope. Actually, I might want to look at that later. So I'll leave it. All right, and now the card, the small card art is showing up, and as well as the large card art, and it looks pretty good. So that has been implemented. Now let's. Uh, we have this new mage. Well, it's a core game mage, but the mage was not in. Um, had not been implemented yet. So let's put her into the game and see what happens. All right, we get some big blank spots and, uh, and an error because we don't have the artwork in. So 
Yeah, because right now there's Mage Cutouts for Brava, Xi'an, and Mist. So we need the Phaedraxa cutout added in. So we're done with this file. I'll close that. And we're done, we're done with this one for now. I'll close that. So here are our Mage Cutouts. And here she is, ready to, ready to go. And let's see what size is she. She's the correct size. And we do a quick export as a PNG. And two, and then. And this is going to go in the Mage Cutouts folder. And hopefully I will spell her name correctly as well. Is probably something in my config file that I forgot to put in. Or I spelled her name wrong. Either way. Um, mages. Oh, she looks alright. It looks alright in here. Oh, I'm going to go ahead and put in the inactive mage panel image for her as well. Uh, I believe this, they're all 1024 by 1024. Now they're 512 in here. So that's, get saved out at 512. So now, make sure she is in the atlas. Yeah, the atlas for the inactive mages. Oh, it looks like I saved her way too big for that. Um, let's preview it in here. All right, so that's good. It looks like. She's the wrong size in the Mage Cutouts Atlas. So let's take a look at why that is. So these are 500 by 700. That's right. Um, so I will save her out in the right size. And I'm just double checking this name. I believe I spelled correctly. Yep. Uh oh. Looks like something is wrong. So. Um, I don't know, but I know that her artwork is in, in there, so both in the inactive mages panel atlas and in the mage cutouts atlas, 
Um, so I don't know if my grandpa is watching, he would probably know what I forgot to do <laughs> because I definitely missed a step in here. But uh, anyways, I will move on for the moment to uh, the card testing scene and take a look at mage mats um, because we got in the artwork for the new age and the new card. Card tester. No, I don't want to save my changes. And there's Rageborn looking all crazy. So let's see. So it looks like that is the current state of the mage mats, and there is some work to do. Alright, so I'll go ahead and mage mat front in here. <laughs> so if we, um, let's see, one of these, all right, if I turn off the image on here and then I press play, we can see what it's currently looking like. And I guess I need to turn it off while it's running. So right now it just has a stretched out version of the character cut out, the name, and the life indicator. Okay. So what we're going to do today is go through and make it look a lot more like the um, Mage Mat except adapted to digital. So there'll be a few, few changes, but... Um, It will look a lot like it. So um, that means we're going to need the background images um, for the front and back of the card. Um, and I don't know if I don't know if the back has been implemented differently yet. Oh, yep, it has. So that's good to know. Um, I think we'll probably start with the front, but I'll get all the all the assets in there. Um, right, because it's. The front is what's here to work on. So let's make a folder for a new atlas for the mage mat. So there's a few steps here. So first I'll make a folder and I will put uh, the images in the folder. Folder. We're going to call it mage mat. Okay. So we need the, um, the character images that are cropped to the size of the, um, the mage mats and the mage mat backgrounds as well as all of the little, um, all of the images and icons and whatnot um, as well. So um, a lot of those things are already in the game, they're being used in other places. and. Um, but if we need them, I'll pull, I can pull them out of the InDesign file, um, which is what I, why I left it open. Um, so let's go back to Photoshop. We got our, our mage cutout put in the game. We got our inactive mage cutout put in the game. So now we will get our mage mat cutouts put into the game. And right now I've kept them at the same um, the same size as the backgrounds. Um, and the reason I'm, I'm going to do that, at least initially, is even, for example, like Jian, you know, could be a lot smaller, um, but some of them have big effects like Edelhelm and Phaedraxa. You know, her, her glow is going to fill up the screen, and I'll show you what that looks like since. It's not in this file. Um, you 
because we want to make sure that there's like clean edges around the or that the the glows like properly fade out that they're not cut off with a hard edge um so i always have to make sure that to leave enough space on the edges um so for right now i will put in uh the, the geon image and right now i have these are uh a thousand by seven fifty six. Um, so they're pretty close to, to four or three, but not exactly. And I'll keep them at that those sizes for now. Um, although, yeah, just for for simplicity for the moment. Um, I may end up making them a little bit smaller or making some adjustments later on, depending on what makes sense. Uh, oops. Mage Man in it, Atlas, and we'll put John in here. And I'm going to put in the other mages that have been implemented as well. So that would be Brahma. And Phaedraxa. And then there's the um, the front card image, and then the crop for the back, which same image but moved up. And I think if we wanted to match as closely as we can with the physical cards, it makes sense to have them separate images. Um, Which is Mage Matt. I'm running it. This is, this is the Mage Matt background front. And the Mage Matt background back. All right. So. Now there's, so I have five images, and right now they're images in Unity, but they're not, if I use them in the game the way they are right now, they would be counted as five separate images. Um, if I put them in an atlas, um, they're pretty big sizes, so it'll, but it'll get them down to like three or two maybe. Um, so how do I make an atlas? Well. Fortunately, there's a whole bunch of atlases already made, <laughs> so I can just duplicate um, one that's already there and um, and then point it at the correct folder. So I'll uh, I'll do that. I don't want to open this. Management Atlas. Make sure I get the name correct. All right. Back in Unity, there should be a Mage Mad Atlas, but it's still pointing to the small turn order folder. So I'm gonna drag the Mage Mad folder over into there. Um, and there's a few different options in here. Uh, right now, it's not doing type padding, packing. Um, so let's see what that looks like, and I'll probably try it again with type packing to see if it makes it more. Okay, so it looks like it made, it puts four images on one page. So it got those uh, five images down to two. Um, and then the second one is a smaller 
smaller size. Um, let's see if I do tight packing, if that makes a difference. And look, um, it actually put it all on one page. Um, although that's a little close for comfort, but we'll see. Maybe it'll be fine. Um, right. So let's uh, test it out. So we can make... the main image I have to go to get the other. that looks like about right um, let's find let's find yeah so that this is what um, the map actually looks like or the physical version of the map looks like and so that isn't doesn't look like the correct crop but um, because it isn't. <laughs> that was the inactive mage panel crop. This is the correct crop. But it is not uh, not scaling correctly. So let's take a look. So the size is 670 by 500, um, which is probably OK. But we want this to stretch across the whole thing. Um, so now the it looks about. Um, about like where it's supposed to be. And we also need the background image. So I'll turn back this on. This I will turn the background image back on and put it in. So it'll be the mage mat background front. And it looks like our mage is transparent. So we'll make our mage be not transparent. All right, so that's already uh, starting to look like um, a mage mat and I don't th and so we can if we go ahead and apply that um, press play at all <laughs> um, it is still not showing the correct cutout because that the new cutout was the new cutouts were not in when um, this was set up so they're po it's pointing to a different a different folder so or a different atlas I guess so yeah because right now it's pointing to the mage cutouts atlas and we want it to point to the mage mat atlas so um, I'll, lock, I'll lock that and here is our mage mat atlas and I'll drag that into here where the mage cutout atlas was. So now, if I press play, it is still doing that. Why is it doing that? Pull card panel. It's pulling in the correct background, but it's not pulling in the correct um, image for the main image. Main image. Now why is it doing that? Age Mat Atlas. I wonder if I forgot to press apply. All right, <laughs> it is pulling it in, but it is not displaying it correctly because of that tight packing. So I'm going to go back here and turn off tight packing. She'll put it back on another page, but it'll show up. It should show up right. Yep. Okay. Finally, we have the right um, the right cutout in there. So, and it's looking right. So, what should we do next? I guess the um, the life indicator is still not looking right. Um, 
but that's not really on the um, the physical card. So let's let me make this a little bit smaller so it doesn't cover up the chat. Um, yeah, and, and if anybody isn't in the chat, um, if there's anybody still watching, I know it's getting late in the day. Um, feel free to pop in any questions um, you have for me. So I guess I will update that life indicator to look like it does in other places in the game. Uh, in the actually, let's go to the just for in case you haven't seen it before um, or you're just joining the stream now. I will go back. Um, to the game view. Yes, my P is telling me to use the same blood drop thing we use in the game view, which is what I was planning to do. Um, and so it looks, you know, like this and that. So it's got the, the image, this image of HP with the HP label on it, and that's using the Gotham Black Beveled font. So we'll go back to our testing scene. Back to our mage map front. All right, so. All right, so our life indicator right now is, has no image in it. So we're gonna put the HP image in there. And it's kind of cool in bright red, but I think we want it to match um, how it looks in other places, so I'll, I won't tint it to make it extra red. And we'll change the label to use the Gotham Black Bubble material. And it looks like we should probably make this blood drop a little bit bigger. Um, I forgot to check the size in the other scene, but I know it, it looked bigger than this. Um, so right now it's 50 by 50, I think. We'll try maybe like 70 by 70. Not 700, although that would make things more interesting. So yeah, that's, then we can make the label slightly bigger too. Maybe 30, all right. And it's a little bit high. It, it's centered, but I'm gonna move it down just a little bit. Um, yeah. All right. So that's looking, it's looking about right. Um, I don't know if that's where we're going to want to place it exactly, but yes, it is because that's where the life label would be. Never mind. Um, okay. So what about our character name? Yep. That looks right. All right. And there we go. Um, one thing we could do is, let me think. Um, yeah. Oh, I can test this out. So I will apply it and press play. And make sure that this card is working with other characters. Yep, there we go. It does seem like the is the name in the right place. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, because there'll be the other other pieces. Um, they haven't been added in yet. Um, I could go ahead and add some placeholder stuff in there. Um, because we are going to need um, charge indicators and things like that. Um, so um, it's not hooked up yet, but I can go ahead and add in an image for it so we can see what it's going to look like. Or actually, I could probably just stick the prefab in. There's a charge, charge panel prefab, maybe? I think that's, I think that's what I'm thinking of. Um, yep, that looks that looks like it. And that'll go. So 
So, yeah, and the physical card, there are these, like, rectangular charges, but we've, we're using it, this, like, kind of pie type uh, iconography in the, in the digital game. So I'm thinking maybe, like, in the bottom right corner would work. Um, and I think it can probably be a little bit bigger than it is. Let's see if that will break it or if that will work. Yeah, it looks like ah, you can scale up slightly. Um, you can see how that's going to look. Um, so that's kind of neat. Oh, I will save my change or apply my changes to the prefab um, so they'll be saved so they'll work for other characters too. Um, or work for <laughs> for when the mage mat is actually actually being used instead of just worked on. And then let's see what makes sense. So breach mage. And, um, so on the the physical card there's this place for the deck to go in the discard pile to go. Um, Thank you, thank you, Migrant P. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's starting to look look a lot like we're you know want it to look. Um, yeah, these purple, the purple thingies. Um, I don't know if we're gonna want them on the mage mat or not, but I did make. Uh, I did make a um, purple outline box that's sliced um, to try out for things. So I'm gonna go ahead and. I haven't actually tried it out in the game yet, um, so I will put it in and then actually then I can show everybody how to slice up Sprite in case you haven't seen that before. It sounds a lot more exciting than it is, but it is kind of fun. Um, so I'll stick the purple outline box sliced into, um, into this Alice. And so let's say we wanted to make to use it somewhere on here. So we'll make an image and put the purple outline sprite. So it looks great when it's a square, but if I wanted to stretch it out, you know, maybe to show where the discard pile is going to go, um, it kind of stretches out the sides and doesn't look real clean. Um, so this is why we slice things. Um, so, so right now, if I kept it like this and I stretch it like way out, like the bottom edge would get much thicker and the side edges would get much thinner and that doesn't look very nice. So I can go into the sprite editor on the image and ooh, that really looks huge. Um, so I can slice it to leave these corners intact so that the the, the corners are always the um, same dimensions. So that's, let's see, let's say it 50. And we'll try it. I think that, I think that should work. Um, looks like there's some graphical glitches in the, <laughs> in the image itself, but, um, I pulled it out of the InDesign file, so something might have gotten broken in translation, but um, it should still show up. So right, so this image is still set to simple. I'll set it to sliced, and now it has nice even borders, and I can stretch it as much as I want to, and this bot, these edges are still always going to be the same. So that is looking a lot better. Um, so I'll just go ahead and stick, let's we'll call that the discard. And the deck. Maybe the deck should be listed before the discard, I don't know. And in terms of placement for it, um, we want why don't we anchor it right centered on the edges here, so. Instead of me just guessing where it goes, I can I can do some anchoring. So, 
zero, zero, and yeah, we'll do 150 by 200. That sounds good. And position zero. So that's perfectly centered on the left edge, and we'll discard, we'll center on the right edge. And I probably should explain what these anchors are doing um, in case you haven't heard already. Because um, I, don't, I don't know if I've actually talked about anchors on a stream or not. Um, maybe I have. So the, um, so the X is, you know, horizontal, the Y is vertical. So like if I said so zero to one and then if I, and then the numbers in left and right are how far they are from each edge. So if it was zero, it would be all the way to the left side. Um, and you can see as you move the placement around it, it kind of, those numbers change and how those numbers change. But I'll put it back where I put it. And um, I think that's, that's probably a good, good place for that for now. Uh, oops, <laughs> I mean, I meant to press apply. Pack up that sprite. So yeah, I think that it's definitely heading in the right direction. Um, you know, we'll continue working on it to get it more polished. I think it kind of seems like there should be some like shadows in the edges. I don't know if there are in the original one. Yeah, it looks like a little bit. Um, can we can kind of we can kind of do that here, can't we? Um, so there's a few ways that I can add shadows. I could have an image overlaying the whole the whole thing. Um, the, with the middle faded out or have four different ones. But I think there's probably, I have a few different like highlight images, um, and inner glows. So I might try sticking like inner glow on and have it real faint on the, on top of the background image. So let's, let's try that. And let's see. Yeah, I think it's it's probably still too opaque in the middle, but and then we can anchor it to the whole thing. So right now, like 0.5 puts it in the it means it's anchoring to the middle of the parent object, which is the mage mat front. Um, and these blue these blue circles um, indicate the edges of the the thing that's being selected in case um, that wasn't obvious, which I don't know that it was. Um, yeah, so zero, 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 zero. And you'll say, well, wait a minute. That looks like it's making it brighter, not darker, because it is set to white. All right, and I can put this probably behind the main image. So it's only darkening the background. And it's way too dark. Um, I can. Line it up. Make it just a little bit. Or another thing I could do is we could take this into Photoshop. Oh, don't want to cover up the chat. Um, and I could just make it a little bit less opaque in the middle. So let's put a black background behind it so I can see what it looks like. Yeah, so that's looking not, yeah, that's looking way too, way too bright in the middle. So we can just, let's see if we want it to be a soft brush. And maybe 45%. That looks good. So, so we want the middle to be totally not, um, not faded out. 
and then softer to the edges. Just wanted a little bit of like a border around it was kind of what I was thinking. Um, this doesn't look real nice in uh, <laughs> all zoomed up in in Photoshop, but I think it'll work for our purposes in Unity. Um, and if not, then we'll try something else. But I think this will make it look a little bit nicer. So I will go ahead and add this to the Mage Mat. Atlas. I thought inner shadow. Okay. So yeah, that works a little bit. That works much better. Um, it probably still doesn't need to be 100%. I'll make it. Just most of the way there. So I think that is, um, it's heading in a good direction, I think, for how we want the um, mage map front to look. I don't know about these purple things, but I think I'll put them there as placeholders for now, just so remember we need to put something in those spots. So I will go ahead and apply it, my changes, and it looks like it is pretty close to 4.30 um, Eastern time now, so that seems like a good stopping point. Um, so I'll just take a look at this and we'll see how it looks with other characters. And our new character that we just put in. I haven't tried her cut out. Oh, I just broke it, so I guess. Something must have gotten missed when I pulled earlier. Um, so that is where the mage mat is. So that's um, where it's at for today. Um, thank you for joining me. Uh, if no one has any questions, um, I will just say thank you for joining. And um, if you missed any earlier parts of the stream, they'll all be up on YouTube. And um, I think they'll probably be on Twitch right after the stream ends. And let's take a quick look at how the Kickstarter is doing. So let's refresh this page, make sure it's looking. So right now it's at 21,846 out of our $30,000 goal. Um, so if you haven't backed it yet, check it out. And yes, I agree with uh, my Greenpeace comment that it's not set up to load Fedraxa properly yet, um, based on the fact that she's not loading it properly. But yep, and there, and John just posted a link in the chat to our Kickstarter. If you haven't already checked it out, um, on the Kickstarter page, there's a, a demo you can play right in your web browser um, if you want to get a feel for how the game is playing. Um, and yeah, I think that's about it for today. And I will um, say thank you and good night. And I'll sign off.